Um, we started session on the Rural City Council for Monday, May 24th, 2022. It was uh, called the Rural. Uh, Kelly, do we have any announcements? Uh, we can do announcement of the public call online. Go ahead, please. Good evening. I'm just having to pull up, so. <laughs> Thank you for joining tonight's Aurora City Council study session. If you're listening on the phone, please note public comments are not taken during study sessions. The phone line is in listen only mode. Uh, the council welcomes comments from residents at regular council meetings on both matters appearing on the agenda and during public and invited to be heard. The phone line opens on those evenings for sign up beginning at 6 p.m. Thank you. Okay, is there an announcement in Spanish? No, there is not. Okay. Um, Mayor Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Kaufman? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Bergen? Here. Councilmember Coombs? Present. Councilmember Gardner? Here. Councilmember Drinsky? Councilmember Lawson? Here. Councilmember Marcano? Present. Councilmember Medina? Here. Councilmember Mario? Present. Councilmember Sunberg? Here. And Councilmember Zavonic? There's a quorum. Okay. Um, we are going to move uh, without objection. We will uh, move item 5D up uh, to the beginning of the meeting to allow time for uh, the outside speaker. Is there any objection to moving 5D up? I uh, see none. Uh, please proceed, staff. Mayor? Yes. Sorry, I'm confused. We're moving that ahead of the interviews? Yes. Okay, and the interviewees are okay with that? Yeah, they have been informed. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan? Thank you, Your Honor. I believe Mr. Dittman is on the line. Brandon, if you could kick us off. Uh, thank you, Dan, and good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Brandon Dittman. I'm outside utility council for the city. Um, I come to you tonight uh, with an issue that has been developing uh, late last year uh, at the beginning of this year, and it concerns a, a rulemaking that's happening in the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, I believe you've all been provided a, a memo on us on this, but I'll go ahead and give you an overview of um, what is happening, what we're asking for. Um, so I, I think as we're all aware, Colorado has been a nationwide leader in greenhouse gas reduction strategies. Um, and in the past, these have been primarily focused in the electric and transportation sectors, along with some oil and gas extraction uh, programs, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from those sectors. Uh, during the last legislative session, the General Assembly also put forth a plan to reduce emissions from the greenhouse gas, or excuse me, from the natural gas sector, the utility sector. And so the, the heat, you know, the natural gas you use to heat your homes or maybe to cook with. Um, as part of that statute, actually a couple of statutes together, they instructed the Public Utilities Commission to conduct a rulemaking uh, to create rules implementing uh, those reduction strategies. And I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but that's a pretty expansive rulemaking relating to um, basically transforming the natural gas utility sector uh, with the long term goal of, uh, you know, having less emissions, less new infrastructure in, in that sector um, in the long term. Um, there is one small portion of that very expansive rulemaking that um, has caused considerable concern among the developer um, and many uh, municipalities, especially the fast growing ones like Aurora. And, and this is rule 4210C. And it, what it relates to is the lane extension policy for new natural gas infrastructure. And so under the current rules, when a new neighborhood goes in, um, the developer you know, builds out that infrastructure and that includes um, both the on lot improvements um, to hook up the natural gas appliances um, and the heating. In addition, it includes all the stuff that's in the streets, right? To get um, from Excel's gas mains um, out to this neighborhood. And um, that's pretty expensive infrastructure a lot of times. 
Um, and so there's a program on the, called the Wine Extension Policy where um, Excel and Aurora's case or another utility in another jurisdiction's case uh, pays for a portion of that infrastructure. They pay a credit, what's called the developer credit, uh, to the developer um, that subsidizes the cost of that infrastructure. That also represents Excel's uh, capital investment in the system, which allows them to both own, operate, and maintain that infrastructure. Uh, right now, that's 28% of the total infrastructure cost. And so for a large development, we're talking pretty significant numbers in terms of what is being um, subsidized, if you, if you wish, by Excel um, as part of their ownership of that system. What Rule 4.2.10c uh, proposes is to eliminate that developer credit. And so um, the, the idea is probably to transition um, residential and commercial developments away from installing natural gas resources. But the concern, of course, is that there's already, especially in a place like Aurora, many developments are already under construction um, or already planned um, with this infrastructure already in place. And because uh, this rulemaking has no um, delayed effective date, um, you know, it's going to hit those neighborhoods pretty hard in terms of additional costs they were not anticipating as part of their financing, and which, you know, ultimately the homeowners will assume um, as an unexpected cost. And so a number of municipalities um, and then also our um, city staff in Aurora have looked into providing comments to the Public Utilities Commission asking that uh, this particular rule um, either be eliminated or delayed um, due to the, the impacts we believe it will have on affordable housing in the near term. Um, just last week, uh, the Colorado Communications and Utility Alliance, of which Aurora is a member, which is a consortium of Colorado local governments on utility and communications issues, um, did decide to file comments on this issue. Um, they did not decide to, to uh, um, say for the deletion of this rule or the rescinding this rule, merely for a delayed effective date to allow those projects under that are already underway um, to avoid this cost and for the new developments who then could make their decisions on whether to include natural gas infrastructure or not, had the full choice up front without unexpected costs. But there are a couple of ways to, you know, to respond to this. I drafted a very broad comment at the request of staff um, that included about the option to either delete or delay the rule. But certainly it's up to the, uh, the council's decision on whether um, the direction it would like to go to either delete the rule or delay it uh, if it would like to file this comment. But I, I believe I've tried to, uh, try to paint as quickly as I could a broad uh, overview of what um, this rulemaking is about and why we'd like to file comments. Uh, just really supporting um, home affordability in the near term to uh, not allow this rule to go into effect um, and create that immediate impact when people weren't aware of it coming into place prior to either constructing or planning their projects. Mayor? Uh, Mayor for Jim. Yeah, um, question. I, I'm I'm actually in opposition of, of the rulemaking and would prefer to eliminate it um, because of the affordability factor for homeowners. And we already have high, high home prices. I think this is gonna put an extra burden on those that are looking for affordable housing um, in our area. Also, I do have a question because it's not just you know, new homes being built, but wouldn't, would this apply to homes that are com going through, let's say complete remodel um, where they ha currently have gas, would they be grandfathered in? Yeah, that's a great question. And in 90% of cases, those new, those remodeled homes would not uh, see this cost because um, this is only for new natural gas infrastructure. So, so long as they weren't ripping out all their natural gas infrastructure and, and uh, you know, rebuilding it, um, you know, they wouldn't fall under the extension policy, they wouldn't be uh, affected by this. Okay, and then my second question is on restaurants because um, we're talking about housing, residential housing um, affordability. But if you're building a restaurant and you're putting in a brand new kitchen, they would then possibly not be able to put in gas stoves, which is, I think, I don't know if we have chefs online, but uh, I think that's the preferable cooking mechanism. Yeah, so this wouldn't prevent um, natural gas infrastructure being installed, um, but the extension policy would affect new builds um, for commercial and residential. Um, the, the commercial impacts are less, and, and the reason for this is, is the reason for that is this: um, you know, where the real costs come in 
um, in terms of that extension policy or for when you're a new development out in green space and you need to build lines to get there. You know, most, hopefully, you know, most restaurants are built closer to where the gas mains and infrastructure already are. And well, so there's going to be new restaurants coming out into the new developments as well. But um, so just real, sorry to interrupt real clear. Um, the, right now, if I understand correctly, they're they're getting the, the builders are getting a 28 percent credit um, from Excel. And that would that's, go away. That's correct. Right now, they're a 28 percent credit, of whatever that infrastructure cost is. And under these rules, presumably that would go away. OK, thank you. Further questions? Mayor? Uh, Councilor Coombs. Um, yeah, so I guess not so much a question as a comment. Um, I think that looking at potentially delaying implementation for projects that are currently underway makes sense. I don't think just delaying it to a date certain where folks are going to then try to get in their projects before that date certain. Um, is something that I would support. I would support something like delaying it for those projects that are currently already in progress. Um, but ultimately, the purpose of this not only is to disincentivize natural gas, um, which is polluting, but it also incentivizes land use that ultimately reduces our climate impacts. Because what this essentially is, is saying, if you're going to build sprawling development, then you have to pay for the infrastructure. And I think that that's right. Sprawling development has massive impacts on our climate and on our infrastructure costs as a city, the infrastructure that we have to maintain, as well as the service areas that we have to respond to with all of the other services that we provide. And so in that sense, I think that ultimately the housing affordability produced by not continuing to engage in the sprawl that we consistently engage in uh, and by using kind of the resources that we already have, the land and the space that we already have to build housing will actually long term benefit affordability and definitely benefit our climate um, in more ways than just reducing the direct impact of um, of gas and the use of natural gas. So um, that's where I'm at on this, is that I think for projects that are already underway, it's fair to say, hey, we're going to let you all finish wow. under the agreements that you already expected to be finishing under. But moving forward, this actually has an even bigger impact on addressing greenhouse gas emissions than just the natural gas use itself. Further questions? Sunberg. Uh, Council Member Sunberg. Uh, first of all, I'd like to publicly congratulate Council Member Coombs on the new baby in the house. And then Thank secondly, you. you're welcome. I'd like to ask if this natural gas goes away, which has been an efficient and cost effective way to heat homes. Have studies been done for the comparable electric uh, comparison? to heat homes, it's, is that gonna be much more expensive? And uh, perhaps Brandon could, could enlighten us on that. Thank you, uh, council member. I don't have the numbers exactly um, in terms of what sort of what we call beneficial electrification is what the industry calls it when you switch from gas uh, to electric and what the cost comparison is, but um, clearly that's a legislative priority of the General Assembly to encourage general beneficial electrification where we're converting that gas uh, to electric. Certainly options exist. I'm not aware of the cost comparison at this time. Mayor Zavonik. Uh, Council Member Zavonik. Yeah, look, I, I am, uh, we had this issue come up and, and at uh, Planning and Economic Development Committee and we were in favor of um, weighing in on the rulemaking. One, <clears throat> to Council Member Sunberg, you asked the question about costs. People are seeing a massive increase in the cost of their utilities right now. And a lot of it's because of this artificial demand by government and, and push by government to try to determine what is the preferable fuel source. And I'm not sure that moving to coal generated power as opposed to natural gas is actually gonna green anything. But the bottom line is, this is just gonna continue, uh, continue the drive to making things more expensive in our city. 
it's bad policy, and I hope that we would weigh in and say that um, we don't want to see this rulemaking go forward at all, but at the very least to pause it for now. Further uh, questions? No discussion? Mayor. Mayor. Um, um, Mayor Pro Tem and then uh, Councilmember McConnell. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so if if we move, I mean, I oppose this. I think I think we should um, still have that credit for for builders. But if we were to continue moving forward to not allowing gas in our communities, uh, what happens when there's a power outage? We just had one in my area. I think it was Friday or Thursday night. Um, that lasted hours, um, and it's probably the third one I've had in the last week. So if you're in the winter and you don't have the ability to use gas fireplaces or cook with gas, you're, you're you, you, you know, potentially causing more problems for residents. So I, I prefer, my preference is to allow the free market to do whatever is competitive and offer options rather than mandate things. Councilor O'Connell. Thank you, sir. I also just wanted to weigh in on in favor uh, of setting a, or you know, basically exempting um, developments that are currently underway from having to um, basically comply with the uh, rules that we are looking at. Uh, and I also just want to stress that you know, we can talk about, um, you know, markets, we can talk about costs today, but you can't really weigh that against the, you know, true cost of environmental sustainability or rather unsustainability uh, moving forward. We've already seen extreme weather events here. We've seen fires in December. Um, I think we should be doing everything we can to ensure that Colorado is habitable, um, safely habitable for folks uh, into the future. And I think it, you know, barring um, any meaningful action at the federal level, it's gonna fall to states and localities to really tackle the climate change issue head on. So I'm in support of what the PUC is looking at, although I agree that we should probably exempt existing or under, you know, developments that are currently underway. I don't think it's fair to change the rules for them in the middle um, of development. Thank you. Um, further uh, questions or comments? I think none, uh, let me get a sense, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Sorry, what, so if we're saying those that are currently being built, what about those that have invested millions and millions of dollars but don't have their site plan approved yet, but they have invested in, in, in you know, the infrastructure? Are, are we speaking those would be exempt as well? Uh, staff, presenter. I think that's a, at the board's, at, excuse me, the, the council's discretion, how I'd like this to be implemented. I think there's a couple ways to do it. One being a delayed effective date um, where, you know, presumably right. the ones that are in the hopper now um, could be exempted or the board could just say any ones that are um, either planned or under construction now. I mean, you can set the, the parameters and what your comment would like to be. And I'm okay. simply here to uh, listen to what your direction is. Okay. But one option is to eliminate the rule. Certainly, the you can ask that the, the rule four two ten C be eliminated it's entirely. That's an option on the table. Okay, um, I'm going to get a sense of uh, the council so we can uh, proceed on to uh, uh, interviewing uh, our candidates. Um, uh, Councilmember Gardner, uh, on, an, on the question of uh, of um, opposing the rule, uh, I support at least how I interpret what's in our packet where. We ask or support elimination of the proposed rule, and alternatively, without that, we would support a phased in or a delayed effective date. Um, so essentially, uh, I'm sorry, uh, so the I, presenter. I, uh, I, think should, I think we should write a letter that we support elimination of the proposed rule, and alternatively, if that if the the rule isn't eliminated that we at least want to see a phased in or a delayed effective date. And that, that that's at least my understanding of how the draft letter is written in our backup. Is that, is that correct? Let me go to the presenter. That, that's correct, Mayor, that it was written that way, but it was only a suggestion. It could be whatever the policy direction of the council is. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, so you, I, I'm taking uh, your cue. Is that, oh, is that okay? I'm basically going on, um, well, I, what support, you stated initially. I support a letter that 
recommends eliminating the rule. And then, you know, if that can't be done, I would follow what Council Member Gardner suggested. Okay, let, so let's go. I'd like the letter to strongly say we. Okay, so like first, I'm going to. Uh, the, the question is eliminating the rule entirely. Um, Council Member Gardner, and then if, if that doesn't pass, we'll come back to yours. Yeah, I, I already answered that. I would support eliminating the rule, though that's not our decision, so we should write a letter asking for that. Uh, Council Member um, Lawson. I support the same thing, but I guess, can I just ask a, qu a clarification sure, question? Mm -hmm. Because I just want to support what I stated at the PED. Does this mean it goes into rulemaking that we would participate in that process or no? I just yeah. want to make sure that's clarified right. into the rulemaking. This will be as part of the public record as part okay. of the rulemaking is what we're asking okay. for. Yeah. Okay, Mayor, then I support that. Elimination. Okay. Um, Council Member Jorinsky. She's having a hard time, I think, uh, technically getting. Okay. I know her camera's not working, but I don't know if her audio is not working. Council Member Zola. Can she write it in the chat? Uh, Council Member, we'll come back to her. Council Member Zavonic. I'd support eliminating it. Uh, Council Member Morio. Uh, Council Member Sunberg. Seems fraught with unintended consequences. I support uh, eliminating it. Uh, Council Member Medina. Uh, not in favor. Okay, opposed. Uh, Council Member McConnell. Uh, I support delaying, not um, repeating. Okay, well, right now it's just, we're just we'll come back to other options. So you're opposed to eliminating. Uh, Council Member Coombs. Opposed. Okay, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I was for eliminate. What are we on now? Um, eliminate. Yeah, I'm. A, I'm yes on eliminate. Okay. Okay. I'm five. A text message. I think Council Member Jarinski is a, also for eliminate, but she can't get into this. Meeting. Okay. Well, she's here now. Council Member Jarinski. Yeah, I'm. I'm for eliminating. Okay. So a majority have arisen uh, for eliminating. So we'll go with that. Mayor Kaufman, just for the record, I, I support delaying and oppose eliminating. I wasn't able to, okay. to work earlier. Uh, let me look at this again. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. We'll move forward with the PUC. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, now we're on the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission interviews. And uh, I believe that uh, Mr. Walls is first up. So what we're going to do is one minute um, introduction uh, by the uh, by the candidate. Uh, each each council member uh, will ask one question, and the um, candidate will have two minutes to answer. Uh, and then there will be one minute wrap up for uh, each candidate. So with that, I believe uh, Mr. Walls is first up. Mayor, Mayor Walls. Yes. Even Elkins is the first um, individual going. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Even Elkins. Okay. Uh, even, please proceed uh, with your one minute in introduction. Hi everybody, my name is Steve Elkins and I'm a candidate for the Planning and Zoning Commission. Lived in Aurora for about two years, moved to the city right as the pandemic was starting, so unfortunately I haven't been really able to get involved with any community organizations. I've been a city planner for approximately seven years and I primarily focus on development review for new major projects. Um, I'm really interested in this position because I want to use the skills that I have not only to benefit my community, but also to see how I can grow better. I, I think we're at an exciting time in our city in terms of uh, a rapidly changing city that is evolving, also looking to its past. Um, you know, Aurora's always been an independent community that's kind of focused on that independent spirit. And I just really would like to be a part of that and contribute um, a master's degree in urban and regional planning 
and uh, look forward to this interview and answering your questions and potentially serving. Uh, Councilmember Lawson for the first question. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for applying um, for this position. What are two of the biggest challenges you see in the city of Aurora in regards to planning and development? Sure, I think the biggest one is not gonna be a uh, surprise to anyone on this call, which is affordable housing. And I think affordable housing is not just, it doesn't just impact the people who need affordable housing, it affects all of us. It affects you know the price of going to a restaurant and having to pay people more to be able to afford to have a place to live. So I think affordable housing and getting more of it and doing whatever we can to make that happen is really important. Uh, I think the other one is, you know, and this is something we see in my day job in Denver, is we see more and more residential development um, taking the place of commercial development. And while I think, you know, we, we certainly need to follow and understand market trends, I think a big thing is people still need services and places to shop near their homes. And so if we only have places where people to live, there's not gonna be much left to do. So those are the two biggest issues that I see. Thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate it. Mayor, uh, point of order. Uh, Council Member Gardner. Uh, Mayor, point of order. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but we were given a schedule, an interview schedule, so are we not gonna follow it? Because it had each council member in, in a particular order. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that in front of me. Okay. Um, no, let's just, I don't think it makes a difference. Okay. Uh, let's just follow this. I'm, I'm okay, Cal, uh, Council Member Gardner, you're now recognized to uh, uh, ask, ask a question. Hi, Steve, thank you for putting in your application. I appreciate it. Um, so my question is, if you were faced with the decision um, for a, a potential development, talk to me a little bit about your decision-making process, the information that you would gather and how you'd go about um, determining um, which way to, to vote? Sure, I think the first thing I'd look at is the staff report and uh, really review that well in advance and see you know where, where staff's position is. I'd also really want to listen to public comment and review any written comments. If I have questions, if I'm able, I'd reach out to staff ahead of the hearing so I could really get some of my questions answered and really be able to focus on that public comment. I think uh, uh, reviewing adopted and it is really important because you know the city and our citizens have invested so much time and effort into into our plans. So I think it's really that combination. But I think really to me this role is about listening um, and really listening to the community and our adoptive plans. But then making a really good decision based on those plans, public comments, and what the application is at hand. Appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Jaransky. I don't have a question. Thank you for applying. Councilor Rizvonik. Steve, thanks. Um, you, you, you just touched on public comment and, and I know that one of the greatest challenges we have with any sort of new development is um, balancing what you hear from the public, but also what is just the plain letter of the law. So talk to me about that balance and, and how you strike it. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing in a lot in my professional role is is really just getting better education to the public because so many decisions are based on criteria. And really that comes down to increasing that education. But I think it's it's a balance because, you know, it's, it's really about balancing community needs versus people who may not want to see change. And I think our communities are changing. There, I don't think there's a part of the city that is not changing. And I think it's really balancing that change versus, you know, what what the community vision is. I think it's really important to listen, to hear the feedback, and, and to really just have that open ear because I think if we shut off that open ear or shut shut people down, they're they're just going to feel like they haven't been heard. And I feel like I've gotten into government service and interest in this position is empowering people and, and making sure that people are heard, but also balancing that against the, the greater needs of the community. Councilmember Murillo. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Steve, for um, your time this evening um, and for applying. Um, 
my question is, are there any um, considerations in terms of equity and access in the planning and zoning and development process that um, you think are important? Sure, I, I, in my day-to-day -day job, I hear a lot about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I think equity and diversity and inclusion, a big part of that is making that actionable and is looking at our processes to see how our processes really weigh and balance an equitable outcome. I think it's really important to define what equity means in a larger context so that it can be applied. I've seen that in my day job where Denver has actually moved forward with certain equity metrics. So I think we really need to find a way, as hard as it is, to, to measure equity and see how, how it is actually playing out in our process. And if we are seeing that we are getting outcomes that are not equitable, we need to take a look at that process and then as part of a process that involves this council, make the changes that make sense to, to get us to the equitable outcomes that we want. Uh, Council Member uh, Sunberg. Thank you, Steve. I represent Ward 2, as you might know, where the future of Aurora is really slated for planned growth. It's very exciting. What, in your estimation, Steve, does responsible growth for Ward 2 look like? I think responsible growth for Ward 2 would look like, and this is something I touched on earlier, is, and this is something I see uh, because I spend time in Ward 2 and I spend time in the Green Valley Ridge Corridor. What I'm seeing right now playing out is intensive commercial development being concentrated around the Tower Road Corridor. And really, we need to look forward and ensure that the people in your ward, just like any part of the city, have access to services and goods close to home so that if they don't want to travel, they don't have to travel and they can really stay close to home if they want. And I think that's really just the important balancing act is, yes, we need more housing, but we also need things for people to do, to play, to participate in a larger community. And, and it really just can't all be about only residential development. There has to be that better balance. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Medina. Thank, uh, thank you, Stephen, for applying. The question I have is, do you see parallels in Denver that you would like to see maybe better put to use in Aurora? I think that's a great question. And I think it kind of goes back to, you know, Aurora's original founding is the town of Fletcher and Aurora charting its own path. I think we need to, as much as we can, um, you know, be great municipal partners, but I think we also need to recognize that if Aurora needs to go its own way, it needs to go its own way. I think certainly what Denver is doing in terms of growing up and how do we grow up better, meaning grow up vertically, is important. And I think it could offer us some lessons. And you know that's something I've actually really been important, enjoy bringing to this job is some of the lessons I've learned. Because often people look to Denver as an example and it's out there, but so much of it, just like any local municipality, is focused around the local issues of that municipality. So I think we certainly have lessons to learn, but I think it's also really important that we maintain the community identity that we have, because I think we're, one thing I can say about everybody on this call is we're proud to be a Warrens. Thank you. Uh, um, Council Member McConnell. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Steve, for your willingness to serve our city. Um, so much of the work of the Planning and Zoning Commission involves relatively straightforward decisions with little controversy, but some items can sometimes become contentious. So how would you weigh the merits of a development um, against community feedback when a development otherwise meets the needs and requirements in code? I think there's, there's always contention because, you know, as much as I see a lot of my colleagues in this profession struggle with that planning being contentious and land use planning being frankly political. But I think it, it's just, it's really important that like, let's say a controversial development meets all the requirements and it's approved and people are still upset. I think that is an opportunity to lean in and listen and provide more education. And if, frankly, people are not happy with the development outcomes that our plans and codes are leading to, I think one of the, the great missions of local government is being close to the people and changing those processes. If, if they're not getting us the, the outcomes that we want, 
I think it's really important to be heard. You know, I, I did read about a contentious meeting near Parker um, and Quincy about the development of new apartments to the existing commercial development. And there were people who were very upset and I was kind of a little frustrated hearing one member, you know, people were acting out and being frustrated, lecturing those people because when you come to a public meeting, you should be able to be heard, you should be respectful, but we should be doing whatever we can to get people to come to public meetings and not shut them down and be heard. And so I think in that vein of contention, there's conflict, but I think successful conflict resolution means leaning in, seeing what we learned about that conflict and, and, and getting to better outcomes going forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Coombs. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Steve, for applying and for being here this evening. Um, my question is, with respect to redevelopment um, in Ward 5, as well as a number of other areas of the city, we have a number of blighted commercial developments. Um, and so how would you, or how do you look at redeveloping those types of blighted commercial developments in a way that continues to serve the neighboring communities. And actually the, the development at Quincy and Parker is a perfect example of that. Um, so how do you understand kind of, as we're moving forward, how we can develop well in those types of developments? I will say that and I'll speak from my professional experience, a lot of my work seems to revolve on taking blighted commercial properties and turning them into either corporate outlets such as gas stations or 100% apartments um, and residential uses. And the thing that always kind of gives me a little bit of pause is as blighted as they may be, they are still affordable spaces and they are still serving a community need. And so I think it's finding that fine balance of okay, if you want to come in and redevelop one of these commercial centers, that's great, we want you to do that, but we really need to work with you and collaborate with you to ensure that those existing small businesses, the barbershop, the bakery, um, these, these things that can't, simply can't be replaced because they probably won't make it elsewhere, we need to find a way to help them come back and, and, or find a, another solution because we can't keep losing these incredible small businesses that, that really give us the flavor of Aurora and make us unique. Um, I, I think it's just, it's a fine balancing act and it's really, what is this future development? Is it all gonna be apartments or are there going to be some commercial spaces? And in Denver, we've experimented with that. We have something called street level active use where in some parts of the city, you actually have to provide commercial uses on the first floor. So it's been re really interesting to see that, but I, I always get a little queasy when I see uh, our existing small businesses displaced because I think commercial displacement is, is, uh, is real and we need to look at it. Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, I'm trying to unmute. Um, Thank you, Stephen, for applying for the position. Um, if you were a commissioner at a hearing um, for a site plan and it had met all the zoning and code requirements, but you had neighbors that were opposed to it, citing traffic issues, reducing property values, how would you decide and why? You know, I, I think position, you're expected to, you know, follow adopted plan codes. Um, something I've seen in my own neighborhood is we've had some redevelopment happen for affordable housing, which is great. Um, but at the end of the day, it needs some tweaks around traffic signage. So working with Council Member Murillo and the Public Works Department, we were able to make that happen. Um, I, I think, you know, people in a, have- In a public hearing? I'm sorry, in a public hearing. Oh, oh okay. In a public hearing, I think what I really focus on is is they tease out those questions. It wouldn't just be, oh, thank you for coming, uh, not gonna really act on your comments. I, I would try to tease those comments out further and see where the true issues are because all development has traffic impacts, you know, all, and, and really it's about 
it, it's not this one development that's just going to create traffic. So we have to look at things holistically. And if we have citizens coming to here and saying there are issues, it, it's really important to get to get the bottom of them. Um, but at the end of the day, if the public, if the public, if the plans and the code say X, it, it's really about following the code and, and the plans. Um, but like I said, it's also about potentially following up later. And if our plans and code aren't getting us where we want to go, fixing them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, one minute wrap up, please. Yeah, I really appreciate the questions tonight. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in this position. I think I could bring a lot of value to the commission just in my ability to apply our adopted plans, to apply our code, and really to, to take it a step further. And if we're not getting the outcomes we want, then, then really listening and leaning in working with people as much as we can. I think the public process, which this commission oversees, is just so important to connect uh, with our residents and really really get to the development outcomes that we really would all like to see. And, and really, you know, leaning in if there is contention and doing our best to resolve it and get to better outcomes and processes. And I really just thank everybody for their time and uh, wish you all well. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Katie, who's next? We have Garrett Walls next. I just let him know that he can log on, so he's getting on right now. Okay, thank you. Is this, did I log in at the right time? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Garrett, uh, for applying for uh, the Planning uh, Commission. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Garrett Walls, Mr. Walls, uh, you are in so many different uh, facets of the city, and I want to thank you for all you do. Um, so let's start with a one minute introductory remarks about why you want to be on the Planning Commission. Sure. Thank you, Mayor Kaufman, and uh, good evening, Council members. Uh, I would love to be on planning commission uh, because it's a little bit different from the ways that I've served on boards and commissions so far. Um, I've had the opportunity to actually present uh, site plan amendments, actually speak on behalf of other developments uh, in front of the other side of the table at planning commission. And at this point, I, I would love to be able to give back to the community and giving my experience over the last 10, actually we're coming up on 12 years in commercial real estate uh, and put that to use finally in assisting uh, the process and being able to help, I guess, uh, help Aurora see its vision uh, and where the city's growing and wants to grow and be a more integral part of that. Um, so I guess that's it for an intro. Uh, Councilmember Lawson for the first question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Garrett, for all you do, and thank you for applying for the position. Um, my question to you is, what are the two, what are two of the biggest challenges you see in the city of Aurora in regards to planning and development? Two biggest challenges. I, I think the first, um, the first challenge that I see is there's always uh, an interesting dichotomy and almost opposing viewpoints between balancing the concerns of a neighborhood and concerns of, of people that live, work, and play immediately around a development with the goals and um, code of a city and the goals of the city's growth. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges um, that's out there. The other challenge I think is, is sort of a hot button topic and it has been for the last several years uh, is really the lack of affordable housing, um, not only in our community, but also in communities all over Colorado. Um, I'm involved with a lot of properties in Steamboat Springs, and that that city as well as Aurora has a real problem providing housing for employees, um, providing affordable housing for their neighborhoods. So I think that those are probably the two that rise to the top of my list. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Gardner. Hi, Garrett. Thank you for your application. Um, my question has to do with your decision-making process. If you were faced with a 
uh, potential development application or decision in front of the Planning Commission. Talk to me about your um, decision-making process, how you would gather information, and how you'd go about um, deciding how to vote. Well, I think the first, uh, the fundamental step is is doing your homework, is looking at the backup, is uh, really reviewing the plan, digging into the code, um, reaching out to staff if there are any questions about codes that I may not be familiar with or haven't really seen before. And I think once you have an understanding of what the proposal is, what the codes are, what the specific policy is, uh, then it's really important to move through the process to look at what public comments have been submitted. Um, are there any uh, negative arguments against or any opponents against? And really interestingly, I like to hear what the proponents actually, how they pitch their, their proposal. You can actually learn a lot in what they're trying to do or trying to gain through the process. So that's sort of my decision making. Uh, I can't tell you how important it is to be prepared. And those have been the things that have really spoken to me in going through the process is really listening to how prepared the commissioners were and how prepared staff was. Um, and it really made it actually easy to go through the process in Aurora. Appreciate it, thank you. Um, Councilmember Jarinski. I don't have a question, but thank you for applying. Councilmember Zvonik. So uh, same question, um, Garrett, thanks for applying. Um, it's it's the striking the balance, and I think this has been a common theme. I've heard a couple other members of the council ask something along these lines, but it's clearly you have um, you know the the needs and desires of the community, and it's and they get that the needs and desires get hotter the closer they are to the development, but then also just the plain language of the city code, and and you know to council member Gardner's question on the decision making process, ultimately, what balancing those two how do you get to where you're going to vote i guess is this a, is it a move forward or not based on those two things and how do you weigh the two yeah i think it's really important when when those two forces are sort of opposed to each other meaning um, a planned development or a submittal and there's a lot of opposition to it you really have to break down and look at what the opposition is looking at and see if there are specific policy areas that aren't addressed by the code that may be an opportunity for city council or for policymakers to address. Um, but looking specifically at the application of code and with the UDO, I, I think education is the biggest thing and really trying to understand specific opposition. And if it's a lack of understanding about how a development's being presented or how a particular submission is being presented, I think for me, I, I like. The opposition is incredibly important, but digging into actually what the opposition is, is more important to me, rather than just saying there are 50 no's and only 10 people here in support. It's actually looking at the no's, and if those things are people are uncomfortable or if they're out of their comfort zone or if they've misunderstood a particular submission, I think it's incumbent upon each of the commissioners to really dive deep and, and kind of push those types of attitudes aside and look at the issues in opposition and does the code meet those or not? Are there issues of policy um, to be referred up to city council? Um, so I'm sort of a code stickler, I guess, in that sense, and that if a development meets all the guidelines, if opposition can be handled in a way that satisfies the code as well as potentially satisfies the opposition, that's the best of both worlds. So. Um, that's how I would kind of look at that and arrive at my decisions. Um, we have to remember that planning commissioners are not policymakers. Um, they're implementing policy that's already created by city council. Thank you. Uh, council Member Morio. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, thanks, Garrett, uh, for your application and for your work that you do for the city of Ready. Uh, my question is, is there are there any uh, considerations of equity and access in the planning and zoning process? Yeah, I, I think outside of talking about affordable housing, which is the hot button topic and, and we can talk all day and for the next five years about that topic. I think the biggest thing that really uh, speaks to me is, you know, one of the biggest equity pieces that's not really mentioned a whole lot is the education piece um, that I think that we've got a lot of developments coming from very sharp, very at the top of the line development companies. And we don't see a lot of unique equity-based development because I think that there's a barrier to access there. 
I think that the city could do a much better job of incentivizing equity development by um, partially an education campaign, by reaching out, by helping people to actually understand. Listen, the UDO uh, taking part in that process over the last couple of years was was great. I'm kind of a nerd like that. I like those details and I like going through stuff like that. But the general public, they were lost. And that's a huge equity concern to me. Um, so I think that we all, uh, even commissioners, when we're making a statement, when we're acting on something, it's really important to have an explanation and to provide an opportunity for the general public to learn, thereby hopefully incentivizing them to actually submit something themselves. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Councilmember Sunberg. Hey, Garrett, thanks for all the service you do in the community and for applying. So out here in Ward 2 where I'm at, there are tens of thousands of homes slated to be built. Maybe one day it'll take us beyond the population of Colorado Springs. What, in your opinion, does smart growth look like for this area? Yeah, I think um, the theme of the evening, at least for me, is balance. Um, smart growth, uh, you know, being in commercial real estate for the last, you know, 10 to 12 years, I've really understood that there's not a ton of focus on commercial development. And, and throughout the process, it's almost an afterthought when it gets through the stages of development, thinking, oh, well, what will people of this particular community actually need? What will they use? Um, in working with the type of real estate that I have over the last few years, it's mostly C-class development. It's not brand new development. And I can tell you the, the lifeblood that C-rated properties are to a successful neighborhood having your accountant within five to 10 minutes, having you know all the goods and services, a check cashing place. We have a hugely underbanked community in the city of Aurora and having all these goods and services um, within a reasonable distance, 10 to 15 minutes, that strikes a balance in commercial and residential development. I think that's absolutely essential if that Northeastern corridor is going to grow the way the city wants it to grow. Thank you. Councilmember Medina. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Garrett, for applying. My question is just uh, around, do you see things that we could implement better in Aurora that maybe you've seen in other metro areas, uh, other communities that we could implement to make sure that we are doing the right thing? Well, actually, I have to. I have submitted in several d different municipalities around the city, including Denver, Thornton, Lakewood, um, and actually in Parker. And I would absolutely say Aurora is the place to do business. Uh, if you want to develop, if you want to be in business, Aurora is it. Because that process, especially in Denver, um, is absolutely painful, or it can be painful just because of the bureaucratic process. And I think that uh, the huge kudos to the development services staff, um, they really walk you through the process. Once you get assigned a planner, I'm not sure how many of you council members have been through this process, but it's it's incredibly holistic. Um, they walk you through, they answer questions, they, they really dig in and do the work. And when you, when you apply to other municipalities, you're expected to have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed when you walk through the door. And even then you're put in this backlog and Aurora has just done, I, I've seen this evolution over the last four years, uh, building, planning and development being incredibly streamlined and it's there's not a whole lot that I would take from those other municipalities. They're really funding opportunities that I might borrow from Thornton, let's say, or even Lakewood. Um, I think that Aurora has a little ways to go in terms of incentivizing development with funding opportunities. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilmember Marcano. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Garrett, for uh, your willingness to serve our city. Um, so my question for you is that much of the work of planning and zoning is relatively straightforward and typically not controversial, but sometimes some items become controversial. Uh, so how would you weigh the merits of a development against the uh, community feedback when a development otherwise meets requirements in code? That's a great question. And it, it's sort of apropos for the theme tonight. Um, I, I think just looking back at our really recent history, the Habitat for Humanity development just east of Havana, man, that's that's gotta be one of your examples right there. 
um, that process was really frustrating for me to watch and to be sort of involved in a district that's adjacent to it because there was tons of community opposition um, that was political. And that really makes me angry in terms of the application of code because code at the end of the day shouldn't be political. Um, you guys get to deal with the political part of it. And that's the way that the UDO is crafted um, to unify and to provide access. And I think that commissioners step out of line when they find themselves as politicians and when they start applying code in specific ways. Um, so I, I think it's gotta be a balancing act. You've really gotta look at the opposition. Are there specific things that the developer or the submittee hasn't addressed? like traffic, like parking, um, like noise abatement, those types of things. If they haven't addressed those, I mean, the question almost answers itself that, that they need to plan for that. And, and that's an answer in and of itself. If they have addressed those, but it's an issue that the community may not understand how they're doing it, I think it's incumbent to flush that out through the process. Because I don't think that we should kill good development and positive development for our communities because people don't understand or they have political hangups one way or the other. Thank you, Garrett, I appreciate it. Council Member Coombs. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Garrett, for applying and for being here with us tonight. Um, my question is regarding um, redevelopment and particularly in commercial areas that are blighted. Um, how do you see the city redeveloping blighted commercial areas in a way that still serves the community um, around that commercial development? Those are uh, really difficult issues. And if you talk to any commercial real estate guy that's not a developer, um, they get very angry at the mention of this because whenever you start to throw around words like condemnation or eminent domain or things like this with blight, it's a very serious conversation because a lot of people in that particular class, let's call it class C and class D real estate, understand that those properties still have significant value to those communities with which they're in. Um, they're, they're probably businesses that have been there for 30 or 40 years that have become stalwarts of their community. So I think it's absolutely a, an axiom province of commissioners to understand that, and policymakers to understand that this is imminent domain and condemnation is a last ditch effort, that the city needs to do a better job of actually figuring out what the property owner might need, what the tenants need, and helping that current owner redevelop his own property um, with some city assistance because they're probably a linchpin of that community, even though there may only be one or two tenants left in a particular development, there's still hope there. Hope's not lost until it's burned to the ground, uh, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you, Garrett, for applying for the Planning and Zoning Commission's really important commission. Um, and I apologize for the redundancy, but uh, we each get to ask our own questions and unfortunately a lot of them are in the same vein um, as a commissioner at a public hearing for a site plan if it has met all of city code requirements and um, zoning and you have neighbors that are opposing it uh, claiming traffic problems um, and also like reduction of property values how would you make your decision and why I think uh, going back a, a couple of answers, it, it's incredibly important to do your homework, to look at the backup and see um, what staff has presented and see through the public process what some of the reported opposition is and how, how the proposal either meets or doesn't even address that opposition. I think that we have a huge problem if the person submitting or the group that's submitting hasn't addressed any of that uh, opposition. But if they have addressed each of those items, um, like I've seen a couple of projects in the last couple of years that have gone counterpoint, point by point, and even spending further dollars to actually redevelop, to do a traffic study, to do other things, to try and help those in opposition, uh, I think you really have to look at that as a commissioner. And if that opposition ends up being political, you have to be willing to step aside from that 
and look and see what the person that's submitting has done and the backup and the application of code. If it meets those things and, and it's purely political, I don't think that that's really a difficult decision for commissioners. Thank you very much. Uh, for a one minute uh, wrap up, Mr. Walls. I wanna thank you all for the opportunity and the time this evening. Um, it's been, it's been kind of great. This is my first time sort of in the hot seat uh, in front of council and, and it's an interesting uh, experience, but I, I think that I have a lot to contribute to planning commission. And I think that I'll work really well. I have some history with a couple of the commissioners uh, that are currently seated. And I think that being able to leave my mark as a commissioner in applying current code and future code into what Aurora is gonna look like in 20 or 30 years. This is my home. It's been my home for the past 14 years and, and I have no plans of leaving. And I'm really excited at the opportunity of being able to help shape the Aurora of the future. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, nice. Um, Mayor, next we have Alexandra Jackson, and she is logging on right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, how are we doing? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Mayor, with this uh, item change, it, it's affecting the interview times a little bit. So she, we reached out to her to let her know she can log in. So we're just giving her a minute to do that. Okay, thank you.
Okay, Mayor, uh, Alexandra is on the meeting. Okay. Uh, Alexandra, uh, thank you so much uh, for applying uh, to the Planning Commission. And um, we don't have a, I don't think we have a video on you. Um, um, I'm here, my video is okay, on. Okay, great, yeah. no, we got you now. Uh, one minute, uh, thank you so much for applying for the Planning Commission. And you have uh, one minute uh, for introductory remarks. Okay, awesome. My name is Alexandra Jackson or Allie Jackson as well. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am born and raised in Aurora, Colorado. I graduated from Gateway High School. Then I ventured over to DU, not too far from my undergrad in English and psychology. And then I also received a master's of social work from the University of Denver. Um, I'm so excited to be with everyone here tonight. The planning um, and zoning information for Aurora is really important, especially being a resident um, who has lived here my whole life. I've been able to really see Aurora grow in some awesome ways. Um, and so just wanna, jumped into the conversation tonight, excited to be here um, and talk to you all about the qualifications for why I should be on this committee. Thank you very much. Um, for uh, the first question, uh, you have two minutes to answer each question and then we'll do a one minute um, um, remarks uh, at closing. Um, uh, so first up to ask you questions is council member Angela Lawson. Hi, Alexandra, thank you for applying and thank you for being here tonight. My question is to you, what are two of the biggest challenges you see in the city of Aurora in regards to planning and development? Thank you, uh, Ms. Lawson, for your question. All right, two of the biggest challenges for me personally would be making sure that community voice is represented from um, the Aurora community when it comes to planning and zoning. We wanna make sure that, um, you know, I have a social work background, so we like to really let the community speak for itself. So we wanna hear from individuals about what they wanna see, how they think the land should be utilized, um, what will be most effective in order to address some of the larger issues. And I think um, the second or the second biggest challenge for me would be um, people who are experiencing homelessness in Aurora city limits um, and thinking about how we can incorporate um, solutions um, to that issue within the planning and zoning uh, board committee. Thank you. Um, Council Member Gardner. Alexandra, thank you for your application. Um, talk to me a little bit about your decision-making process. If you were faced with um, uh, a potential vote uh, in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, what what steps would you take to gather information, learn about an issue, and ultimately decide how to vote? Yeah, definitely. So I want to pull in multiple members. I have a, a theory of pedagogy that is highly um, equitable and social just aligned and with social work, right? But I don't know what it's like to be a small business owner. I don't know what it's like to be, you know, a large family who has to maybe uh, juggle taking kids to school and things like that. Um, so really pulling in community voice just to make sure that I know um, I have a diverse um point of view that I can use in order to make that informed decision. Um, because I don't wanna go into um, a meeting or try to make decisions just on my own because that's never good and I don't have all the perspectives. Um, so definitely looking for outside perspective, um, kind of documenting, getting everything organized, looking at pros, looking at cons, trying to make sure that, you know, if somebody's really for something, I have an opinion from somebody who's maybe against it. So then I can look at it side by side and make an informed decision. And then I'm just gonna consult with my colleagues and the people who have been doing this work for the longest uh, time, just so that they can bring their historical knowledge. Um, and then just making sure that we all come to a, a, a decision. Councilmember Jorinski. I have a question, thank you for applying. Uh, Councilmember Zwanek. Yeah, I was just uh, looking through the um, the backup material in your application and then listening to your opening remarks. I guess one of the, the questions I have that stood out is just, what is the experience you have in planning and zoning that um, you, know, you think you would lean on as you're making important decisions on this committee? Yeah, definitely. So I have a lot of experience with gathering information and doing assessments. So at my um, 
last job, currently I sit as the Associate Director of Equity and Social Justice Programming at the uh, Metro MSU Denver. But in my last job, and that's a new job, so I'm going to talk about my last job at the Community College of Aurora for a little bit. We did a lot of assessment. Um, so we were building large programming for students of a particular demographic and trying to make sure that our outcomes are being met. So really it would be looking at what is our strategic plan for uh, planning and zoning and how are, are the decisions that we make that we make lining up with those just to make sure that we are being accountable as a committee as well. Um, so really a lot of that like assessment knowledge I'm gonna lean on. And then just as um, a social worker, I did work with the unhoused population in Denver. So really I can bring that perspective of just, you know, I would go and meet with my clients where they were. So whether it was in their car or on the streets or in um, a shelter and just kind of hear from that perspective as well of, you know, what does shelter look like? What does plan? How does plan? How can we get your voice um, heard for planning and zoning committees? So a lot of community work in that regard of just getting different perspectives, bringing it together, assessing things, looking at objectives, putting them against a strategic plan and making sure everything is aligned. Thank you very much. Um, see, uh, Council Member uh, Moreno. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Alexandra, for applying and for, for all of your work in community. Um, it is much appreciated. Uh, my question for you um, is, are there any considerations of equity and access uh, in the planning and zoning process? I think absolutely. I think as a resident from Aurora, I have had to see a lot of people that I grew up with, people who went to Gateway High School, graduate, families that, you know, were friends of mine, move away just because of, you know, the increased cost of living um, and just not feeling the, the change in demographics that are represented and things like that. So that is super equitable, is super inequitable when you grow up in a, in a community and you can no longer afford to stay in that community that you call home. Um, I would like to make it an opportunity for everybody who's born in Aurora to have a pathway to stay in Aurora. That's what we really want. And how I see planning and zoning doing that is creating those spaces for the people to, to cohabitate, to enjoy, to spend money, to um, you know get, get access to resources. So really addressing all different types of like SES levels racial dynamics, uh, gender, identity work, all sorts of, of that to see, to running assessment, seeing, okay, well, how is this plot of land going to be used? Um, what do we need in that area? Looking at ratios of apartments to single family homes um, and all, all sorts of things. Like I'm a big data person too. So I love equity and data. So really looking at where the numbers speak, where there are gaps in equity as it comes to planning and zoning and what what infrastructures we need to support our community is, is a big question of mine. Thank you. Um, Council Member Sumber. Hello, it's nice to meet you, Alexandra. Thanks for applying. Let's see, a balance between residential and commercial. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? How that maybe in a brand new area or an existing area of town? Definitely. Um, I think that when you're talking about residential versus commercial, there has to be a, like a golden ratio, right? Because you want people who are living around the commercial areas to be able to access the commercial areas if they don't have a car, if they like to bike, if walking is their only option. And we want to make sure that those commercial areas are open to all sorts of diverse populations. So, you know, do we have wheelchair ramps? Um, are the buildings accessible to everybody? Um, and with residential, I think it's really important to respect what single family family homes want? What kind of neighborhood do you want? Building a lot of community within each zone and residential is important. Um, and then programming. I, you know, I do a lot of programming in my current job. So to see like the communication between commercial and residential, um, like for instance, the Stanley Marketplace does a lot of outreach into the residences around it. Um, and then, you know, and I live in the uh, Aurora Cultural Arts District, which is 80010. So I'll get a lot of outreach to that. And it's very successful. A lot of community programming. Um, that I didn't think would bring me into a place like the Stanley Marketplace, but I spend a lot of time there. Thank you, Alexandra. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Councilor Medina. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Alexandra, for applying. My question is just uh, around, do you see things that we currently do well in Aurora or not do well in Aurora compared to, say, other cities? Definitely. 
Um, so I'll fall back onto maybe something I'm just a little bit more curious around some growth areas for when I was interning um, for social work school. I worked at the community or Colfax Community Network, which was servicing the motels along East Colfax. Um, and one thing that, that we ran into issues was, was where are our homeless shelters in Aurora? You know, we're the third largest city in Colorado, um, and yet we have Mile High Behavioral Health Services at the time. So I am dating myself. That was like about four years ago. It was the only place. So I'm sure there are more options available now. I hope there are. Um, but it, that was one of the only places there. Um, so that's a big question I have is just how are we sheltering people? And then a, um, a place that I think we're doing really well is just expanding the growth and embracing um, what the strengths that Aurora has, which is we are such a diverse community. I haven't left Aurora, thankfully, because I haven't had to and because I love the people. Um, I am I'm very proud of, of Aurora, where I come from. I want to work for Aurora. Um, I love the, the refugee immigrant population. I've always found, you know, recognition in, in the community. Um, so I think just growing is, and, and including our or diverse population and including them in a conversation, a table, a seat at the table um, is something that we do very well. Thank you. Um, uh, Council Member Medina. I just asked Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, boy. Council Member McConnell. <laughs> right. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Alexandra, for your willingness to serve our city. And also, I love the energy you're bringing. Thank um, you. Yeah. So my question for you is much of the work planning and zoning commission uh, of the planning and zoning commission involved relatively straightforward decisions with little controversy, but some items can sometimes become contentious. So how would you weigh the merits of a development against community feedback when a development otherwise meets the requirements in, in city code? Um, so just to, sorry, a follow up. So it's, there's tension between the community and the development, but the development meets the codes. Yeah, so the development uh, complies with city codes and ordinances, okay. but there's uh, issues in the community. So how do you balance those two? I things? see. Yeah, definitely. So I want to hold some public forums, community forums. I want to invite the community to come in and voice their issues with me so that I can just hear what the issues are. Um, and maybe even a lot of sometimes tension comes out of miscommunication. So maybe something just wasn't understood. Um, maybe something needs to just be explained in a different way. Um, but then if it's not miscommunication and they're still unhappy, showing uh, the community because they are community members how that they can use their voice to to maybe make change. Maybe it's going to a city council meeting. Maybe it's um, getting with other neighbors and um, canvassing and talking to other neighbors and seeing about how maybe together there can be a collective voice and that can have a bigger impact. Um, but definitely understanding the limitations, like we can't make everybody happy. Um, and, you know, my the role on this um, advisory board, you know, it can only go so far. So just trying to stay neutral, um, being open, taking a very person-centered approach, listening to people, um, validating their concerns and then giving them a pathway, even if I can't help them, that they can continue to take to advocate for themselves. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilor Combs. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Alexandra, for joining us today um, and for applying for this commission. So my question is with respect to um, redevelopment projects and specifically of blighted commercial um, properties. So a lot of times there are proposals to redevelop those into some residential or into mixed use. How would you approach um, redeveloping those types of properties in a way that still serves the community. Right, yeah, definitely. And I think that's where surveying for um, qualitative feedback, holding focus groups for community members to attend, advertising that to the community, making sure, you know, if, if it's, you know, bilingual information we need to provide, just making sure we understand the community so that we can communicate to them. Um, so holding those forms, letting them kind of uh, tell tell us, what would you like to see? What would be the most helpful? You know, you live in this neighborhood. This is where, you know, your, your um, taxes go to. You know, you spend the most time here. You're the expert in your own community. Um, so really just letting them voice their concerns. 
um, and, and what they want to see. And then taking that, so really just using this position to advocate and, and take those concerns and just bringing them up to the, the city council and commission level so that they are being incorporated into planning and, and, and zoning. Um, and just you know, pushing, you know, because this is a seat where you represent people. So making sure that their voices are heard. Um, and I think it's also providing the people with with accurate information. Um, so if we do have an idea, I've been a part of the um, the third or is it the 14th? Um, the redoing 13th or 14th? I can't remember, but they had they had this like big group where they where they sent out zoom links and we all came on we talked about mixed use what we want the sidewalks to look like um, they even held sessions where you could go out in person and you could you know ride your bike up and down and they had plants where you could look at and see hey how does this greenery look so really getting that community engagement so that community is on board so many times you just see those yellow signs where they're having a hearing somewhere you're not quite sure what's going on um, they're, they're talking about re redeveloping fences are going up bulldozers are coming in and you're like, wow, that happened so fast. And and how did this and and why? So just making sure that their voice is heard and that the information is is given to them in a very upfront way um, that they can digest and understand. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Alexander, for applying for the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, so my question is, if you were a commissioner and you were at a public hearing for a site plan um, and you heard that it had met all the city codes uh, or code requirements and also the zoning, but yet the neighbors opposed it, claiming traffic concerns, reduction of property values, how would you decide and why to approve oh. or not approve the plan? Definitely. So I want to hear, so we have all the concerns. I want to hear what my colleagues have to say, right? Are there instances in the past in which we've had kind of this tension between the community and what we're trying to approve? Um, and, and how was that handled historically? Um, so really leaning on my colleagues of just, you know, what has happened in the past that we can do this? And then what are your thoughts? You know, like, here's what the community is saying. The, the zoning is all there. It's met. What do we do? Um, and 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 then let's say we approve it. How are we then going to deal with the backlash from the community? How are we going to, to try to repair um, the harm or just maybe bad feelings between uh, our commission and the community? Um, and and just, just making sure that we have space for people's voices to be heard really. Um, and just leaning on my colleagues, you know, we're all, we're here for a reason. We have a passion, we have experience. We're here to serve the community. Um, so I, I'm not the expert in everything. So definitely want to have a community voice. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much, Alexandra, uh, for a one minute uh, wrap up, closing remarks. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's been an honor to be here. This would be an amazing opportunity to be able to serve on this commission. A lot of growth for me and then just bringing a lot of, you know, that perspective of an Aurora resident who has watched the city change. Um, the perspective of a person who works in higher education um, and specifically deals with equity and social justice issues. Um, and it was just an honor to be here and speak to every one of you. Um, and yeah, I just thank you for your time. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for applying. Thank you for your interest in our great city. Yeah. Have a great um, night, everyone. Do I just sign off? Or... Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Becky Hogan. Uh, I reached out to Becky Hogan and let her know we are ready. So she should be logging on right now. Thank you.
Good evening. Uh, thank you, Becky, uh, and thank you for all your service to the City of Aurora. Uh, you have uh, one minute for opening remarks, and then we'll begin with questions from members of Council. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you so much for this opportunity to apply for reappointment to the Planning and Zoning Commission. It's been an honor to serve. I was appointed to fill a two-year term, and I very, very much have enjoyed um, my commitment to planning and zoning, and I am here to ask for your consideration to serve a term with you. It is notable for me um, that while I've been on planning and zoning for two, almost two years now, we have never had one planning and zoning commission um, meeting in person. It's all been by Zoom. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Lawson for the first question. Hi, Becky. Um, so thank you for applying. My question to you are, what are two of the biggest challenges you see in the city of Aurora in regards to planning and development? Um, two things. I think just general growth, and that can be anywhere from a diversity of housing inventory to commercial growth, but we are expanding quickly as a city, and we need to keep up with things like transportation needs, infrastructure needs, public safety needs as we grow. So while we have been blessed with a good deal of land, we also have a responsibility to grow wisely um, in the development of that land, making sure that our residents as a whole um, prosper and that what we have, we do well for them. Thank you, um, Council Member Gardner. Hi, Becky. Thank you for your service on the Planning and Zoning Commission and for reapplying. Um, my question is, talk to me about your decision-making process uh, when you're faced with a vote. Um, how do you gather information? What steps do you take to come to a conclusion to ultimately decide which way to vote? Sure. It has been my history because we as planning commissioners receive our information on a Friday. By Monday, I've read my entire packet. By Tuesday, I have visited the site. And by Wednesday, I've made sure that all of the questions that I have for staff have been answered, that I've done my own homework related to what is being proposed and some of the history on the site. I think that one of the, um, one of the things that is unique about my skill because I have been on the other side of the table is knowing how the process works knowing how the code applies, and basically understanding how these merge. Um, I also look to filter decisions through council policy. You said, how do you make your decision? I look at what council policy says. I look what, what public opinion has to say. I read the responses from the neighborhood. I make sure that um, people feel heard. Um, I know the code requirements, and if I don't, I make sure I know how they are applicable to the situation. And then finally, I look at the needs of the entire community. Are we meeting the needs? Are we furthering um, what is economic and um, smart growth in our city as a whole? Thank you. Let's see, um, Council Member Jarinski. I don't have a question. Thank you for reapplying. Council Member Zahani. Hey, Becky, thanks for applying. A um, uh, question that is a similar theme. I don't know if you've been tuning in so far, but as, and you touched on it a little bit, is this conflict or potential conflict between the, the plain language of the code and then, um, you know, the sometimes the will or the desire of the public. and. You mentioned having to weigh that and looking at the comments from the public. At the end of the day, and this gets to the question that uh, Councilmember Gardner just asked, when it comes to a decision making, um, so from a decision making standpoint, how do you weigh that comment, public comment versus the plain language of the code in your decisions? Um, again, I think that you have to use some common sense in doing this, but there are still components. So. You have to weigh what the code says because we are bound as planning commissioners to abide by the code. And if there is a problem, we're responsible legally for that decision. But we also need to consider the needs of a neighborhood. Um, 
there have been three contentious uh, planning and zoning commissions. Um, and there is a likelihood that all three will be reviewed by council. So we, we are also responsible for you in the justification of our decision. But it's looking at what is the best for the neighborhood. It is looking at what is the best for our city, um, as well as what the code requires that we allow. So it is a balance between the three. I, I have seen, I've seen you as council members actually anguish over some of the decisions that you have needed to make. Um, but it's a, again, it's a balance. I guess that's the best that you can say. And if you're keeping all of those things in mind, and if that's your filter, then frankly, you are doing a good job as a planning commissioner. Uh, Council Member Murillo. Thanks, Mayor, and thank you, Becky, for applying and for your service to our community. Um, my question um, is, are there any considerations of equity and access in the planning and zoning process? There are always <laughs> considerations of both equity and access. The city of Rivera Aurora is a very diverse community. And one of the things that I would say is that there's a process um, that does favor larger development and development with a good deal of money behind it because it is not inexpensive. And what I think of is some of our minority business that simply want to get a site plan through our city. And there may be language barriers or a simple understanding of a process. And a lot of these smaller businesses are not able to engage some of the um, resources that larger land developments are engaging. So it's being mindful. And I, I will tell you that I have seen planning department almost go in excess to make sure that some of these folks have some of the tools that they need that are challenged by the mere process to be able to develop. The same thing occurs with the building department. Um, and while planning doesn't oversee in any way a building department, it's, it's that which brings equity. Um, I am hoping that those types of discussions will be a part of the red tape committee that council members of vomit is working on because it's a real deal. And um, I think that there are ways that we could improve in that. Thank you, uh, council member Zvonik. I'm sorry, council member uh, Sunberg. Hi, Becky, thanks for your service and application. Uh, as you're familiar with all the wards in Aurora, uh, you know, a place like Ward 2 may grow so fast, too fast perhaps. And if a ward does signify it's growing too fast, what factors could signal that it is? Well, Council Member Sunberg, you live in one of the most interesting parts of our city. You live in what you know as Ward 2, but it is also sub area C. And within sub area C, the, the approvals out there are administrative. And while that has benefited a group and frankly, faster development, um, it has also challenged some of the arena in which the public are able to give feedback. So I think that it is, I think that it's looking to balance those two. How can we continue to basically enable development, but still have public input? And for right now, that is not true in sub area C. And that's a, poly, a policy discussion. And that's one that last week at Planning Commission, we did ask staff to look at a conversation, hopefully with policymakers like yourselves, to be able to say, is it time to revisit something like this? Because there's very little public input out there. Thank you, um, uh, Councilmember Medina. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Becky, for applying. Thank you for your service. Uh, my question is just, are there things in the planning and zoning that you feel we do really well, uh, maybe better than some other cities, or things that you think we are not doing as well? 
So for before my retirement, um, I had the opportunity to look at planning departments literally across the country. So not only in the metropolitan area, but across the country. And there were two things that stand out to successful cities. One is the competitive costs. What is it? What does it cost to develop in the city of Aurora in comparison to our neighbors and again across the country? The second is sticking to a schedule. So it's one thing to develop a schedule. And I think that the city of Aurora probably 10 years ago kind of revamped their schedule and it was a hallmark for the city. It was one of the best processes. The problem like in anything else is sticking to the schedule. And that's become more and more challenging for any kind of development, whether it be small or large, time is money. So I think that ways that we can improve is simply to stick to the schedule that was originally designed and have that be the normal as opposed to have that be the exception. Thank you, Councilman McConnell. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Becky, for your willingness to serve the city in this role, uh, and or for your existing service and for your willingness to continue, I should say. Um, so my question for you um, is similar to a couple that you've heard here. It's that much of the work of planning and zoning involves relatively straightforward decisions with little controversy, but there are some items that become contentious. So uh, for those contentious items, how would you weigh the merits of a development against community feedback when a development otherwise meets requirements in code? Well, I'm going to use one that may still be contentious, frankly, and that is I sat as, as a planning and zoning commissioner during the habitat uh, project. And frankly, it met the requirements of the UDO. There was also some neighborhood, immediate neighborhood opposition. That was also filtered through the needs of having an affordable housing concept. And I think that we have to listen to all of those. And Habitat, we may do that in that space. It may, we may not choose to do that in another area because it doesn't meet the same requirements. So I think it's looking at a specific area, assessing the needs, uh, listening. I mean, we, we listened to that neighborhood and they were vocal on both sides supporting and not supporting. Um, and in the end, again, I think for me, and the reason that I voted to approve recommendation of that rezone is because it did meet the code requirements. It did meet um, what the owner wanted to do with this property. I think it met the need for affordable housing in our city. Um, I think that there were opposition that could have been tweaked better. So just so that we're clear on this one, I supported the re the, the recommendation for rezone. I did not support the site plan only because I thought that there could have been more work between the neighborhood and habitat. Um, but those are some of the things for me, same filter, for that specific site. So it's not a one size fits all for me. I think that you have to look at all of the elements in a project. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Coombs. Hi, Becky, and thank you for joining us and for reapplying for the commission. Um, my question is regarding blighted commercial development and redevelopment of those areas. Um, so how would you approach redeveloping blighted commercial properties in a way that continues to serve the surrounding community and neighborhoods? I was involved in the redevelopment of what we now know as the point. So nine mile station from the conception of the TOD to the rezone of King Supers to the construction of what it is today. Um, I think that the process was for that particular thing, listen to the neighbors. Um, the neighbors wanted a new shopping center. They wanted redevelopment there. 
and they knew what they wanted as far as components there. Um, and I think th through the years, they were able to work with the owner. At some point, I think that staff chose, as well as the Urban Renewal Authority, to exercise some of the tools that they had to see that redevelopment occurs. I think that one of the important concepts, I guess, of redevelopment is trying to get ahead of it. So rather than wait until a project is there and let's scurry to do everything that we can and then it's the developer versus a neighborhood um, and whatever impacts there are around the surrounding neighborhoods is to look at what we can do and identify. I mean, frankly, we know what is blighted. We know areas in our city that are gonna look to have redevelopment in the future. But getting ahead of it, going out, whether it's through community groups, grassroots groups, and finding out what people want, and then going to a developer arena and saying, this is what our neighborhood wants. This is what our neighborhood will support. You can make money by providing both. A quick example with that, that it's not development, was the community garden at Stanley Market. They went and they actually surveyed their neighborhoods on what kind of fruits and vegetables do you want and will buy? And that's what they grew. And they sold just like that because the needs of the community were expressed and they found somebody that um, were able to provide something and it was gone because it's what the neighborhood wanted. I would like to see us um, work together to get out in front of some of this and do some of those needs assessments. And frankly, I think that um, some of that has already taken place. I think that we all could benefit if that was done even more. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, Becky, for reapplying for planning and zoning. Appreciate your work on this commission. Um, as a commissioner at a public hearing for a site plan, um, and if it had met all city code requirements and the zoning, but yet you had neighbors that opposed it, um, claiming traffic issues as well as uh, reduction in property values, how would you decide and, and why? And I know this is a bit redundant based on some other questions. Nope, and I, I frankly, again, I think that's very relevant because I watched you um, English over the decision in Saddle Rock. I knew that was very, very difficult. For me, with that, I looked at what was proposed. What would the impact have been if they built a grade school, a middle school, or a high school on that piece of ground? Particularly what the traffic impact would have been. And frankly, it would have been very significant, more than what people think. Um, there are some people that love living by a school. There are others that don't. Um, I'm watching schools cost huge amounts of money to construct. And I'm also watching our schools being closed all over. So if that's not the highest and best use, what are other alternatives? The thing that I noted there that as a planning commissioner, um, I actually do review now. And that's to make sure that master plans and the history of some of those things, that they are not, that any um, conflicts with, regarding those plans are addressed when the plan is adopted. There was a conflict in that plan, frankly, and it created a good deal of confusion. Over a 20 year time frame, <laughs> it was even harder to sort out. So again, as a planning commissioner right now, I look at those plans, I read the notes in those plans. I wanna make sure that they're not in conflict. So five to 10 to 20 years from now, somebody else is not faced with that same challenge. Um, that's why I think it's so important to make the time uh, to look at the backup, um, to make the time to engage with the neighborhood. 
Now, we don't have some of the same freedoms as commissioners do the U.S. Council. We don't get to go out there and meet with them or meet with the school district or others. We just don't have that opportunity afforded to us. Um, but those are still some of the considerations for that particular uh, site that we looked at, that I looked at. Um, and frankly, I, I watched as you guys looked at that and the developer, in my opinion, made even more concessions before they came to council than what they made for us. And that, that has to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Uh, one minute uh, concluding remarks. Thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Um, I have loved my time serving on planning commission. And one of the joys for me is planning commission as we currently have it structured really is, um, it represents the diversity of the city of Aurora. We have people from all different sorts of walks of life, all different ages, all different races that serve on the planning commission. I'm asking for your support um, as I would love this opportunity to continue my service on the city's planning and zoning commission. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Becky Hogan. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Christopher uh, Belia. Mayor, he is logging on right now. Okay. Okay, Mayor, he is on and ready to go. Uh, very well. Uh, Chris, uh, Christopher, thank you so much uh, for applying uh, for this particular position uh, as a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission. And, uh, I, you know, I don't have a video of him. He, he is on, Mayor. I, I believe when he starts speaking, you'll be able to see okay, him. Okay, very well. Uh, you have, uh, uh, Christopher, you have one minute for opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody on the council for considering my application. Um, as some of you may know, my name is Christopher Belila. I'm part of a loose volunteer organization called We Are A Town. Uh, and I have gotten interested in the last a uh, couple years of how I could help the community here in Ward 1, uh, specifically with simple things like cleaning up the trash, trying to make uh, the Colfax corridor a little bit more visually appealing, while at the same time hoping to inspire others uh, to get involved and show interest in Ward 1. Additionally, I am involved trying to connect variety of people and organizations that are interested in helping Ward 1 and the community kind of revitalized. Uh, I absolutely enjoy the diversity of what Ward 1 is. I think it's an amazing area, and I think it is something that is kind of due for a renaissance. So that's my background. I'm not anything special, just a person who cares, a person who wants to see things uh, improve in my area as fast as I've seen things improve in other parts of Aurora. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Lawson for the first question. Hi, Christopher. Thank you for applying. Um, my question to you are what are two of the biggest challenges you see in the city of Aurora in regards to planning and development? And I know you talked about your area, but I'm looking over city overall. So in terms of the two biggest issues for planning and development, um, I think there's one thing, Councilperson Lawson, that we have to keep in mind is that I see planning and development also tied with public safety. Um, businesses, developers, heck, even residential people do not necessarily want to invest the money and the time in terms of being in an area that has public safety issues. Now, I do understand that the public safety and crime rates vary by different wards, which makes it more advantageous to be in different parts of Aurora uh, versus areas that have higher crime rates and we have less law enforcement. Um, I take my hats off to the city council. I know law enforcement is an issue and it's one that you guys are working on, but I think it's something that we have to recognize that despite our best attempts with master planning, despite our best attempts to bring in developers, uh, I don't think that developers, be it schools like the magnet schools that we are gonna have here in Aurora, I think it's a tough sell if it is not an area where it's safe for the public to come and use the developers development areas. Uh, the second thing that I think that is pending on, on development um, is that for, and this is just a non-educated statement, is what we are trying to develop Aurora as in terms of development. What do we want to be known as? Do we want to have an identity of data centers out by the airport? Do we want to be mixed use facilities in one area? What's our plan for Ward 1? And I think we, you don't necessarily have to have A, B, C, or D, because I understand that Aurora, just like every other city, has areas of opportunity that they become known for. Um, so between understanding what Aurora wants to be and number two, combining public safety with planning, I think number one, I think that's one of the biggest issues for planning and zoning. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Gardner. Thank you, uh, Chris, for your application um, and being here tonight. Uh, my question is, tell me a little bit about your decision-making process. If you were uh, faced with a planning and zoning uh, vote, talk to me about how you gather information, what process you would work through to ultimately decide how to vote. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, the, the one thing that, the first thing that I that you have to look at is you have to depend on the city planners. You know, I understand the role of, of zoning commission is not based in policy. Our job is to make the decision based on the most, the best and available decision. Now, in terms of leaning on or taking the advice of the city planners, I think that's the first place you look. Uh, they have they vetted the, the product? Have they done their due diligence from, and basically have they made a good argument why this is even in front of the city or the zoning commission and then potentially in front of the city council. So in terms of, let's just look at that first element, I'm gonna ask the professional. If there is anything that I have concerns, I'm gonna ask them the questions um, of addressing those concerns and listen to their answers for why they believe it fits city code, why they believe it fits the master plan, why it is in line with the zoning and the confines of development in the area. Um, I will be very honest with the city with with the city council. I am not the experts to say, oh, I know more than the city planners. I'm going to lean on them. Uh, secondary is I'm going to ask questions about the from the developers themselves. You know, this is our concern. Why are you thinking of doing this? What is the impact? Have you considered? Uh, I do not consider this position a simple rubber stamping of any de development plan that has worked its way through city planning that gets to uh, the zoning and, and planning group. Thank you. Um, uh, Council Member Jorinsky. I don't have a question. Thank you for applying. Council Member Zavonik. Christopher, thanks for applying. Um, uh, the question I've been typically asking is gonna get asked later. So I'm gonna spare you of that one and just jump into it. The other one, I'm looking at the 
the um, the backup in your application and I've had the opportunity to hear you answer a few questions and just curious to what experience do you have in your background professional or otherwise that would prepare you to um, you know make decisions on the planning and zoning commission should you be appointed that's a very good question and I think it's one that I have to be completely truthful for my experience with zoning and planning is very very limited um, I will say that I, I've done some research and I wouldn't say I would probably be the first person ever to be have applied to be on the, the commission who isn't. But to your point, and it is a fair point, uh, my experience directly with zoning and planning is nothing. Now, what do I bring to the table that offsets my lack of experience with zoning and planning? I'm a, a 20 plus, is it 20 now? No, it's almost 30 year plus veteran of corporate America that I have been involved with process, procedures, development uh, of a variety of things within the corporate world, which brings maybe not necessarily completely apples to apples comparison, but it does bring a professional to the table who's been involved in decision-making processes, who's got critical thinking skills, uh, and just on a final note, someone who just cares about this community. Um, if I would not get appointed today, Councilman, uh, it doesn't change the fact that I'm still going to be involved in supporting this community, hoping for growth, hoping for safety, uh, and things that make Aurora a, a better city, especially in my ward. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Morio. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for applying. My question is, um, do you, are there rather um, equity and access considerations um, in the planning and zoning process? Crystal, this is, or I'm sorry, Councilman, uh, Councilperson Murillo, there's got to be. Um, you know, one of the things that we have seen across this country, um, be it on social media posts or stories in the news, is that minimum wage has stayed flat for almost 12 years, but you look at the, the price of housing. Uh, I think I saw someone today who said that their first apartment when they got out of college was $350, they were making $7.25. That same apartment today is $1,600, but minimum wage hasn't risen. So to answer your question in terms of equity, the it has to be part of the solution simply because the economic mechanics have not allowed a lot of individuals to continue to grow financially to afford housing at the cost that it is today. So I am uh, a, a believer in it because I think systematically we most people can't afford housing. But I do think there is a balance between making sure that we have equitable housing for those who can't as well as a, a community that's vibrant that has businesses, also has housing that other people will pay overpay for. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Sundberg. Hello, Christopher. Thanks for applying. Uh, Ward 2, where I live, is uh, just ripe for growth and opportunity. What do you think it should look like in 10 years? Before I answer that question, I'm going to ask you a quick question. What is go? What are you seeing in ward, in your ward? Uh, tremendous possibility and developers wanting to build many tens of thousands of homes. There is a uh, bit of a lack of certain commercial basic needs, mm -hmm. but it is certainly slated for some very exciting things. Fair enough. Fair enough. And by the way, I appreciate you answering my question before I decide to go off on an uneducated ten, uh, tangent. Yeah. You know, something that I would like to see, and I, I think this appeals not just for Ward 2, but in other areas uh, in Aurora, is I would like to see, how do I put this? I would like for us to see an investment in our community for our people to be able to afford to live in our area, be it bringing in trade schools, bringing in additional medical schools, bringing in something that we can 
benefit our individuals to stay in, in the community, to eventually to afford houses in this community, to eventually be able to shop at the stores in those communities. So I'm not completely honest, I'm not too familiar with all the details of your area, but one of the things I would love to see is more opportunity for the individuals within our community to better themselves. My dad was a hospital CEO. He partnered with local colleges to bring in RN programs, LVN programs, phlebotomy programs, x-ray techs, you name it, so the people in the community could have high, better paying jobs and enjoy the benefits of being in the community versus ending up renting you know, an apartment or a condo from somebody who came in and is going to buy six houses in your ward and rent them out at twice the price. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Councilmember Medina. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chris, for applying. Uh, my question is just uh, around planning and zoning. Do you see things that they are doing currently that are doing well or things that they could improve on? Well, my experience with the planning and the zoning, I constantly look at Ward 1. Um, and I think you have seen some amazing projects, be it with the Fitzsimmon campus, the buildings, be it the hotels, the office space, the mixed use facilities that are showing a really good master plan. And I think they've done a great job on it. The question that I have when I look at my area, uh, because I'll be frank, I think some of the other areas in Ward 1 are uh, nicer communities, is that I don't necessarily see much planning going on in terms of simply the Ward 1 area. I know we have existing buildings that have been in the Aurora community. I see that they have uh, have brought value to them. I would be in favor of seeing additional developments that are equitable, that bring in office space, that bring in um, retail space that supports the community. Thank you. Um, Councilor Medina. Should be Marcano. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Marcano. He gets. <laughs> thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Councilor Medina, and also thank you for uh, Christopher for your willingness to serve the city. So my question for you is that much of the work of planning and zoning uh, involves relatively straightforward decisions with little controversy, mm -hmm. but some items can sometimes become contentious. Sure. So how would you weigh the merits of a development against community feedback when a development otherwise meets the requirements in city code? First off, Councilman, thank you for your question. Um, I'll be frank, you cannot have a yes or no answer or bl a black and white answer to this. I think you have to take it as a case by case uh, development. Um, and I also have to think you have to take a look exactly on what those individuals are concerns are. Um, you know, it would be very easy to give a blank slate to developers to come in. I don't believe in giving a blank slate, even if it meets city codes when there are community and social objections to the project. I think I have to look at it. I have to have a better understanding. We have to ask questions. We have to have um, input from everybody involved in the decision. Um, if it is something that is of irreparable harm to the community over a development of a project for a business, I'm a little more protective of the community at times, um, especially when developers have the means to either A, address those concerns or come up with potential solutions, or B, locate addition, uh, other areas for their locations. But it's a, it's a case by case, and I think it's a, uh, an ethical balance you have to find. But you just know, and everybody should know on the city council is, it's just, once again, not a rubber stamp just because it necessarily meets code. The final thing that I would also say is, I would also seek guidance from city council. Um, I know that there, the power is there that if we deny or approve, there is certainly an appeal project. Um, and I also would look for guidance from you guys before it might even head that way. Thank you, uh, Councilor Robert Coos. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Christopher, for applying and for joining us. 
Um, my question is about uh, redevelopment and particularly in Ward 5, we have a number of areas that either are blighted or that may become blighted that are in commercial um, commercial developments, commercial centers. So how would you approach redeveloping a commercial center that has become blighted in a way that still serves the community, the surrounding neighborhoods? Sure, sure. It's a good question, council person. Well, first off, I think, you know, one thing that before we talk about redevelopment, I understand that we should make every opportunity to support the businesses that have already been there uh, and who are existing and in some cases maybe thriving. Um, I understand that the city has a code enforcement. Uh, I will admit to the city council, I got one of the wonderful city code uh, enforcement letters for some weeds while I was gone for about three months. Uh, but I also understand that the city has a program to help businesses who are wanting, who might be, let's say, blight, to reinvigorate. Um, and I think you should go down that path before you even open the discussion for redevelopment. It's only when you get to the point where you have to have redevelopment in the area that you get to that, that conversation. So specifically, how would I address redevelopment in an area? One thing that I would like to see, uh, and this applies here to Ward 1 and, and for others, is a continuation of the development that reflects the community. And I, as much as I love Starbucks, you know, the last thing that we might need in this world is another Starbucks on another corner in an area that would be a redevelopment opportunity. I would rather see a Jubilee coffee, which we have here in Ward 1, than I would see Ward, than a Starbucks. The long and the short and the point I'm trying to make is I would encourage either A, developers to redevelop in a manner that is consistent and reflects the community. Uh, make sure that it has the opportunity for minority-owned business, women-owned business, first-time business owners that is part of the community versus redeveloping and it looks like exactly something else you see in another area. That would be the premise that I would hold for redevelopment. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pritam. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, Christopher, for applying for this commission. Um, and my question is um, basically as a commissioner for the um, that is attending a public hearing for a site plan. Um, if you heard that all um, that the development had met all city code requirements and zoning requirements, and yet you also had comments from neighbors opposing it, claiming traffic pattern problems, uh, reduction of property values, how would you make your decision and why? Good old traffic problems here in here in Denver and Aurora. Um, first off, I'd have to look at the value what of the the overall project, what it is. If it's something that is negligible in terms of community value, um, and while it is certainly something you may want to have in your business areas, if it ultimately hurts the property values of the residents and the neighborhood that will spend the money in the community. I have to balance that and give serious consideration to the residential side of it. I'm not going to say that I would be outwardly saying if everybody says it's going to hurt our property values, but the one thing that I, I, I've got to stress is for a lot of us, this is where we live. And it's very easy for us to get lost in terms of simply building and developing businesses in the area. I cannot say with a clear conscience, I would always say, yes, I am going to vote, even though it meets city and planning code. If it has a serious negligible impact that is studied and documented, I'd have to give that consideration. Thank you very much uh, for a one minute wrap up. 
Uh, I'm assuming that's for me, Mayor. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Concluding remarks. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Christopher. I I will say this first. Off, if I if I don't receive the votes to get appointed, I want to simply say thank you. Uh, it's not very often that anybody or often that we get to interact with the city council members on, on this level. Uh, the second thing I would like to say is you guys have a tough gig. Uh, I recognize that this role is not a policy role. This is to help make sure that we are following the rules and making sure we're giving consideration to the people that development will impact. Uh, and the third thing that I would say, and I think this is the most uh, appealing argument for at least serious consideration is I'm embedded in this community. Um, I care about this community. I have been vocal about wanting this community to be stronger. Now, if I get elected to the board, fantastic. I would love to be part of that process, learn more and see the impact that we're going to have on our community. But I also will say, generally, if I don't get elected, I respect your decision, and it's not going to change uh, my efforts to make sure that we're doing a good job here in Aurora, cleaning up the community and getting people involved. I appreciate your time. I thoroughly respect the work you do. I know it's not easy, especially when you have a lot of different constituents pulling you one way or another and, and, and being vocal. I appreciate your time. Christopher, thank you very much for applying. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Council, the time is now uh, 741. Uh, we will stand in recess until 751. Uh, Council is now in recess.
Motion of the Aurora City Council is uh, called uh, back in session. Um, item number 3A um, is um, uh, whether or not uh, council supports moving forward uh, with uh, donating $5,000 uh, to recovery efforts uh, for the Boulder County fires. Half of this would come from uh, the um, Council Contingency Fund and half would come from uh, the General Fund to support the victims of the Boulder County fires. Uh, discussion? Mayor. Uh, Mayor Potem. Yes, I'm fully um, in support of uh, giving the $5,000 split the way that you just uh, noted. I think um, anything that we can do to help the victims um, you know, um, is would be very much appreciated by them. Okay. Is there any opposition to moving this forward? Uh, seeing none, then uh, item number 3A will move forward. There are no uh, issue <laughs> updates. Item number 3B, uh, consent calendar uh, 4A through 4B. Um, um, <coughs> item number 4A. Uh, is, is there any opposition, opposition from, uh, to moving item number 4A forward? Seeing none, item number 4A will move forward. Is there any opposition uh, to moving uh, item number 4B forward? Uh, seeing none, item number 4B will move forward. Um, item number 5A, City of Aurora Housing Strategy Update, uh, Jessica Prosser. Good evening, mayors and members of the council. If I can have share access, please. Mayor and Council, can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Jessica Prosser. I'm with the Housing and Community Services Department. Um, this is meant as an informational only update um, to the housing strategy, which was approved in December of 2020. So we had committed to council that we would come back and provide some updates on the different things that had happened regarding um, implementation of this strategy. This here is just kind of a brief overview of the six different priority areas and policy areas that we've been working towards. We've created some internal working groups um, cross-departmental, which has been um, very beneficial in working with developers that are looking to build affordable housing and preserve affordable housing in the city. Um, we've also been able to collaborate on things like rental assistance um, and some of our um, homeless services as well across the city. So um, with the departments coming together, that has happened over the past year. Um, I would just say overall, there's a lot of interest um, in affordable housing in Aurora. We have about 20 different projects in the pipeline um, and continue to hear from developers um, through our Office of Development Assistance and just through my department of folks that, that are interested. This is the housing spectrum that we had put together um, as part of the plan, wherein there are opportunities for housing at every level. Um, from folks that are at the poverty level all the way up to executive housing and higher income housing and making sure that we have a good balance across the city as we continue to develop our greenfield areas and then redevelop areas throughout the city. On the left hand side of the slide you'll see different projects that are underway related to those different parts of the spectrum. So as staff we're making sure that we're putting um, you know resources and capacity into those different areas um, our uh, community investment process, which I'll talk about in a minute, is really split between home ownership options as well as rental options. Um, so just want to note that we are working on things across the spectrum and again have the different um, types of households on the left hand side here and then the housing types that correspond. So in our production and preservation area, um, we have focused in on our community investment process. This is something we're doing twice a year. Um, we're getting ready to um, release our winter round of funding, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, on Wednesday. And so over the past year, we've been able to support 614 new rental um, units, as well as 125 homeownership options. 
So our community investment process compiles our different federal funding sources, both through HUD as well as our private activity bonds um, to have a competitive process for developers and those that own affordable housing um, to um, apply. So this breaks down the different projects that we have supported. Um, it has the areas of the city. It has the number of units associated with them, um, the different income levels that um, are supported. And again, you know, average median income for a, a family of four to qualify at 80%, which is where the threshold is for most of our um, funding is about $80,000, just, just for reference. Um, then we have the different funding sources that were attributed to them. Um, the private activity bonds have been very competitive over the past few years. We've had quite a bit of demand for them. And the way that the um, Colorado Housing and Finance Authority looks at this is they're really looking for local commitment of private activity bonds to then match at the state level. So we have a lot of developers coming to us to then want to go to the state to leverage our um, local dollars. To just kind of zoom in on a couple of projects, um, Liberty View is one supported by the Housing Authority. It is on the Fitzsimmons campus. It's supportive housing for veterans. Um, and so that one did receive tax credits and the city has supported that project over the past year. The other one highlighting is the point which um, kicked off and groundbreaking earlier this fall. Um, and so that's another exciting project um, in the Ward 4 area. Um, so just wanting to make sure that we're supporting projects throughout Aurora um, with our community investment process. In terms of places and process, one of the things that we had been um, identified through the housing strategy was what about city owned land? What about a land inventory? What about working with the schools on schools they may be closing or, re or sites that are prime for redevelopment? So the city worked with our real property division to identify sites using the criteria you see here at the bottom um, that would be prime for development. We were able to identify a few pieces of city owned land that could meet that criteria and we've created a process. So we would say, how do we choose someone to redevelop that city site? How do we know that it's a good site for redevelopment? So we've piloted this uh, process um, using a site that's across the street um, from the MLK library. Um, and it is, uh, there's an old duplex on it. It's just north of the Fletcher Plaza um, senior apartments that the housing authority owns. Some of the pieces of land are, are owned by the housing authority and some by the city. And so we did do a design charrette process uh, for that property. Um, this fall came up with just, you know, feasibility for what could be happening on that property. The next step would be to do some community engagement and then put out a request for a developer. So we're still in the process here, um, but just one of the pieces was developing a process for city owned land and then looking at what land could be available throughout the city. One of the other things just wanted to highlight that's happening is the city uh, received a grant from the Department of Local Affairs for $112,000 uh, to do some policy um, analysis around incentives for affordable housing. When we work with our Office of Development Assistance, often when we get asked about fee waivers, we get um, asked about um, softening some of the things in the Unified Development Ordinance, um, some of the things we already have in there related to affordable housing and what else could we do. Um, so this is exciting. The city is not having to put any of our dollars towards doing this analysis. Um, we did receive that grant. We're still waiting on a grant agreement from DOLA, so we have not even started yet, um, but this came out of House Bill 21-1271 uh, um, last year. So we did apply for that and there will be more to come on that, just kind of uh, planting the seed. So just in kind of the, the continuation of implementation, we will kick off our winter round um, of community investment this Wednesday. We've already done an outreach to developers. They know this is coming. We have $21 million of private activity bonds, about $3 million of home funds, about 1.5 million of community development block grant money. And we will be putting 1.5 million of the 5.2 million of ARPA funds already put forth in the 2022 budget for affordable housing um, to try to um, incentivize some more of those um, pipeline projects that are coming. Several have readiness um, and are in sort of a shovel ready mode. Um, others are, um, you know, more in the pre-planning and, um, uh, you know, feasibility studies at this point. So we will be bringing all of those back uh, through the process to Horns and then to city council as we get those um, back. We'll have them back by mid 
February. And so you would expect those agreements to be coming back sometime in March to city council. Um, and again, just continuing some of the other things that I mentioned that are um, in the hopper for implementation of the housing strategy. That's all I had tonight. Just a quick update on the housing strategy. We'll be bringing back more things through uh, the Horns Policy Committee throughout the year. And I'm happy to answer any questions at this point related to the strategy. Questions for Jessica Prosser? Um, I just I just want to say that that I personally and I think uh, Councilmember Coombs uh, raised an environmental issue uh, today in terms of uh, of density versus uh, sprawl, and uh, uh, I, I believe that um, environmentally, and I believe in terms of uh, providing more housing for more people, I think density is better, <laughs> and so I just want to put that forward. Um, uh, any further questions or comments, Mayor? Uh, Councilman McConnell. Thank you, sir. I actually just want to add, uh, I agree with what you said, but also it's uh, more economically resilient and uh, financially responsible for us as a city to be looking at density as opposed to sprawl as well. It's a lot less infrastructure to maintain. I agree. Yep. Across the board, <laughs> we ought to be looking at density, but certainly when it comes to uh, affordable housing. Uh, any further questions or comments? I see none, Jessica. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, item number 5B, a use agreement with Regents of the University of Colorado for use of city office space. Um, uh, Eli Watson, or Ellie Watson. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Ellie Watson. I'm the Business Services Manager for Public Works. Um, I'm also joined by Gabriella Hakabo. She's the Director of the Community Connector Program at CU. And hopefully shortly, uh, we'll also be joined by Neil Krause. He's the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Initiatives and Community Engagement at the University of Colorado. Uh, we have here before you this evening a use agreement between the city and the University of Colorado for use of office space at the MLK Library. Uh, we first began an arrangement for office space with uh, CU in 2014 as part of the Aurora Strong Resiliency Center and the university's Campus Community Partnership for Health at Hoffman Heights Library. Uh, the Resiliency Center has since closed its doors, but the CU staff continues work at Hoffman and in the community. Um, now under the Community Connector Program and CU's Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. So when um, the CU team reached out to the city to update the existing agreement uh, based on the reorganization, we decided it was best to initiate a new agreement because City Council um, passed in 2015 and use of city office space policy. So. This agreement will also relocate the office space used by CU from Hoffman Heights to an office on the second floor of the city's Martin Luther King Jr. Library building. Uh, the location is in line with the future vision of the second floor of MLK. Uh, it will keep CU in their target area for the community, uh, but will also allow more flexibility in library programming at Hoffman Heights. So unless there are questions for me, I'll pass it over to the University of Colorado and they can talk a little more about the Community Connector Program itself. Uh, please proceed. All right, I'm passing it to Neil Kraus. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Neil Kraus. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Initiatives and Community Engagement at the University of Colorado Institute's Medical Campus. Um, and uh, real briefly, the Community Engagement Program is really the signature initiative within the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. Um, at CU Anschutz and the community engagement staff work to ensure community resident participation and uh, provide leadership um, and, and teach leadership uh, concerning community projects and activities um, to residents in concert with students, staff and faculty of the campus. Um, we have a community connector and the community connector conducts meetings and conversations in the community to discover residents' goals, aspirations, and concerns for their family and the community. And what's learned is shared with the academic community on campus to help create a 
better understanding of the community the campus serves and advocate for solutions to problems related to health, um, economic opportunity, and educational attainment. So the, the community connector uses an inclusive, inviting, respectful, and resident-centered net networking approach to help make connections that facilitate an, an increase in community participation alongside with our Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. And the participation network includes a group of residents living in Aurora called the Resident Leadership Council. Um, our community connector is Gabriela Jacobo. Um, and, uh, and, and basically what she does, she brings a diverse group of people um, and organizational partners uh, into the university to help learn about, become involved with, um, and potentially benefit the community. So basically it's, it's a partnership between university um, and Aurora residents. The RLC serves as a critical conduit, we believe, between North Aurora community and the students, faculty, staff, and leadership of, of student of, of CU Anschutz. Another strategic goal of the community engagement program is to help create leaders in the community through the development of entrepreneurship skills and advocacy. The program works closely with the Aurora Economic Opportunity Coalition and the City of Aurora Small Business Development Center and serves to provide direction and guidance to the El Alba Catering Cooperative. El Alba's mission is to support Aurora-based food entrepreneurs and small business owners through the provision of culturally appropriate business incubation, um, shared business services through a co-op co model. And to date, the program has raised more than $180,000 toward a new commercial kitchen for the El Alba cooperative. This, this cooperative in turn provides commercially available meals to the campus as well as to the community. So the, the lease we're seeking um, uh, will allow the community engagement program and uh, uh, the community connector program within our community engagement initiative um, to work and embed itself within the North Aurora community rather than have our staff located on the Aurora campus, on the, on the CU Anschutz campus. Um, by working alongside the neighbors we serve, it's important that our community engagement program is able to stay in much closer contact um, on a daily basis with its collaborators and to help uh, build strong relationships. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, questions for um, uh, our staff or University of Colorado? Uh, Mayor? Uh, Mayor Patel. I just, um, in reading the lease, so it's a two year lease, and then there was something about the parking lot um, in terms of availability of spaces that would be for city staff first how are they right. going to work that out <laughs> i think that might be hard well we we have we have two staff members and and one one full-time staff member and one part-time staff member okay. um and, and so it, i mean i think the idea is we don't want to take up your parking spots um and and if there's an a, an occasion where we can't uh, when when Gabriella or um, Nancy can't get a parking spot, they can they can we have an office for them back at the. Okay, it's only a few positions. Okay. Yes, it's only two. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, other questions? Here. Uh, Councilmember Lawson. Um, hi. This is mess this is for staff. I just had a question. So you're moving. Uh, we want to put you in this space. I know that um, during our budget discussions that are coming up for the workshop, um, there's going to be some funding asked to actually for this program for an extension. I'm just wondering, is it for an extension or is it to just fund this this program, the connector program? Um, for additional staff or for whatever you need for the space as well. I just want to see if there's connectivity there because we're so, being. Who's speaking? I'm sorry. This is Ellie Watson with public. Oh, I'm sorry, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, thank you, council member Lawson. Yes, there is funding um, in the list of projects for ARPA for renovation of the second floor of MLK. The entire second floor right now is vacant. Um, so CU is going to be use, using just one office and then they can use the community rooms and things throughout the building um, by reservation. 
uh, like all of the public can. Uh, so the renovation of the second floor would include an office for the CU Connector program, um, but the rest of the renovation is around the library programming itself. So it's not connected to this program. Uh, the reason why the program's a good fit for the library though, um, is that the second floor, you really wanna activate it more and bring more people to the library. So this is just another place where the community can come for additional resources. Um, okay. But the programming that's in the ARPA funds is um, like maybe doing a maker space, some more steady huddle rooms, um, moving the adult computer lab up to the second floor so they can expand children's programming on the first floor. Um, so not related, but uh, the adjacency is perfect. Okay, thank you, Ellie, I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, further questions of staff? Uh, seeing none, is there any objection uh, to moving item number five B forward? Uh, seeing no objection, item number 5B will move forward. Item number 5C, proposed low-income household water assistance program. Uh, Joanne Giddings. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And may I please have permission to share my screen? Oh, uh, please, okay. Okay, and are you all able to see? Yes. Okay. So my name is Elizabeth Gillitzer Gallardo, and I am the Billing and Revenue Senior Supervisor with the Water Billing Department. I'm here to discuss LEWAP, which is the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. So to start, Aurora Water already has its own water assistance program in place called Aurora Water Cares, which was implemented in 2018. Aurora Water Cares is a completely separate program than LEWAP. LEWAP is an additional water assistance program, which is fed federally funded through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. For customers to utilize this program, we would have to enter into a vendor agreement with LEWAP. If we enter into this agreement, Aurora Water customers could benefit from both water assistance programs, Aurora Water Cares and LEWAP. Some information on the actual LEWAP program. It was created by the Colorado Department of Human Services Again, it is separate from Aurora Water Cares. It is a completely different program ran by a different agency. It is a one-time program with $15 million in funding. It is a first come first serve basis for customers. The program started, in November, uh, started on November 1st, 2021, and it plans to end April 30th of 2022. The program ends when the funds are depleted or the April 30th date is reached as of now. We don't know if they have plans to extend the date, but we do know that they still have funding and they're still accepting vendor agreements. LEWAP is associated with LEAP, which is a low income energy assistance program. If a customer qualifies for LEAP, then they automatically qualify for LEWAP if they fill out the appropriate addendum in their application that is sent to CDHS. CDHS processes all LEWAP applications. LEWAP customer qualifications are identical to the Aurora Water Cares qualifications. Customers must complete the LEAP application with the appropriate addendum. They must earn a maximum household income that does not exceed the HUD 60% median income level. They have to pay the utility directly for drinking water or, and or sewer and wastewater, proof of lawful presence in the US, and they have to provide LEWAP with a recent water bill, and they also must be past due, have services disconnected or in the process of disconnection. The only difference is that Aurora Water must sign the LEWAP vendor agreement with CDC. The guidelines are different though than Aurora Water Cares. LEWAP will pay the entire balance on the account down to a zero balance. They do not have a cap on how much they will pay for each customer. Also, again, it is a one-time program. A customer will not receive additional assistance at a later date. Some background on Aurora Water Cares. Aurora Water Cares was implemented again in January of 2018 with initial funding of 20,000 from Aurora Water. Aurora Water Cares partners with Energy Outreach of Colorado and their participating nonprofits, and Energy Outreach processes all Aurora Water Cares applications. The program has the same qualifications as LEWAP. The guidelines are different than LEWAP though. Customers have a cap of 500 for which they can be approved for. They can be approved one time per year and up to four times in a lifetime. In, 2000, in March 2018, we started to accept donations from customers to help support the Aurora Water Cares program. 
And the way donations are accepted is through the bill remittance slips, online payment portal, cashier's office, and through Spirit of Aurora. So far today with Aurora Water Cares, we've helped 715 recipients, which is a total in awards of $130,967.44. And for customer donations, we've collected a total of $24,978.80. There has also been supplemental funding from the general fund during the pandemic as well. So as you can see, we've helped many customers with Aurora Water Cares. And due to the current pandemic status, we hope to sign the vendor agreement with CDHS quickly to help even more customers out that may be affected. Again, Aurora Water customers could benefit from both water assistance programs, Aurora Water Cares and LIWA. Again, thank you for having me. And do you have any questions? Questions to staff? Mayor. I'm sorry, Councilmember Medina. No, Marcano. Councilmember Marcano. All right, thank you, sir. And thank you, Elizabeth, for the presentation. I do have a question uh, with the uh, relief funds. Is that able to be used to go towards not just uh, paying uh, portions or the entirety of a bill, depending on which program is being used, but also for um, administering any kind of repairs uh, that might be, you know, um, that might need to be um, undertaken to address a leak situation. I asked because I actually had a constituent who ended up with an exceptionally steep water bill due to an uh, undetected leak for some time. So is that something that we could address? Um, that? If, if it is part of their water bill and it's part that's approved during the process, then yes, it could cover that. We also have the additional leak assistance program that is done through our water as well, if they qualify. All right, great. Thank you. No further questions? Mayor. Um, sorry. Um, oh, Mayor Bridget. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so the the other program um, that is being done with the American Rescue Plan, it, so if they meet qualifications, they can get that funding and then they can still apply to the city. Um, so I guess my, my concern possibly is, um, if they apply for the other one and, and are funded, are we possibly excluding people that didn't apply for that one and still need, you know, and still need our funds, but versus getting funded through both sources? Does that make any sense what I'm asking? Well, they, they can be funded through both programs, um, but truly if they go through LIWAP, they're gonna get that one time to cover the entire amount. Um, let's say though that they get back into arrears, they can always apply for water, rural water cares afterwards too, or vice versa. I don't know if that's what you were asking. Well, yeah, I just, it, my, I think my concern is with our funds, if they've already applied through the other program, are we in a way um, excluding how many people could apply through ours? Because <clears throat> they, they could, get money from them and from us, is, I guess is my concern. Okay, and so the issue is that you don't want them to get money from both of us or be keeping them out of one or the other program? Kind of, I, I, I don't want it to be so that someone takes advantage of both programs and then that leaves out potential residents that didn't apply for the other program but really need our help. Okay. Um, with the programs, I mean, we, we have a process that's going to be done through both of, through our department where we're going to be documenting, you know, the accounts and then putting how much is there. And we do have plenty of funding still left in the Aurora Water Cares program as well. We have about 300,000 there to ensure that we're helping customers and we still have donations coming in too, to hopefully supplement that program. Okay. So you don't think it'll be a, a, an issue? No, um, I don't. We we are averaging about, um, I want to say for recipients, we averaged about in December about $9,000 total for recipients. Um, okay. And if we have 300,000, we, we don't see that being dwindled quickly. Okay, and there's no way to know that they applied for both at the same time. We would know, know that LEWAP would not know, but we would know as the organization because we are going to document the account whenever we get a call, oh, if it's from Energy right. Outreach or if it's from LEWAP. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No further questions? 
Uh, seeing none, is there uh, any opposition to moving uh, 5C forward? Uh, seeing no opposition, 5C will move forward. Uh, we've already dealt with um, 5D um, and so 5E, safe outdoor space update, Lana Dalton. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Could I have the shared capabilities, please? All right. Are you able to see my the presentation? Yes. Perfect. Lana, switch your display settings. Ah, okay, thank you. How about that now? Is that better? Okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you again, Mayor and Council, for having me tonight. Uh, my name is Lana Dalton. I'm the Homelessness Programs Manager for the City of Aurora. I'm just going to give you an informational only safe outdoor spaces update. Um, we did this in our horns policy committee meeting and it was decided to move this forward. So. There we go. So, 1st, to start off with, we have a safe parking lot um, and that's located at 1560 East 6th Avenue. Uh, the operator of that location is the Colorado safe parking initiative. We have a total number of 20 vehicles allowed. However, we have increased that to 36 to allow for individuals that have been displaced from the fires um, and to allow them to sleep out of their vehicles at that location. Um, the lot opened in June of 2021. So far, we've had 61 vehicles who've been referred to the lot. Um, we do go through a very, uh, I would say a pretty intense process um, to make sure that folks that have criminal histories and whatnot are mi not mixed in with individuals that have families with children that are also living in the lot. And so um, there are some folks that were denied due to criminal history. Uh, we have 13 households that did not follow up. We have 15 that are on a wait list currently. 20 households have been provided safe parking and seven households have exited, exited the lot. Out of those seven, we've had a 42% success rate of, of obtaining permanent housing. So this is double uh, a traditional shelter model, which is pretty impressive. Um, some of the requirements include folks have to have registration and insurance, no sex offenses, and no contact with police uh, for the last three years. There may be some exceptions made depending upon if the review uh, committee decides that that would be appropriate for this uh, individual or family to be there. It operates 24 uh, hours a day with quiet hours from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, they have a zero tolerance for substance use. And after three days of no contact, say a vehicle leaves the parking spot and, <clears throat> excuse me, and they don't return, uh, they will give that parking spot up and another uh, family or individual can park in that lot. Uh, the lot offers porta potties, community meals every Thursday, a planet fit. Planet Fitness Voucher to access showers and things of that nature, a laundry facility, computer room, and boutique. <clears throat> um, this is our pallet shelter site. Um, so it first opened in July of 2021 with, uh, with tents, uh, but we have swapped those over to 30 pallet shelters. Um, so far, they've sheltered 109 people. The average length of stay is between 80 and 90 days. Um, there's, there are wraparound services offered here at this location as well. Those include case management services, housing navigation, employment, behavioral health, medical and basic needs. 26 of the individuals uh, have obtained employment. 14 have moved on to other housing solutions, uh, much of that including permanent housing or uh, reunification of family. And 47% of these folks have obtained benefits that they haven't had in the past. So things like food stamps, Medicaid, uh, those things. We repurposed the tents that were at the uh, safe outdoor space at the Salvation Army at the 1566 location. Um, and it, the operator there is also Salvation Army. So there's 25 tents on a lot. Um, we purchased a uh, additional tents as well per council's request. Um, they were the Army grade tents um, that we placed uh, on this location. 
Uh, the current cost to heat the tents there is about $1,500 a week. They're running off of a generator, which is just uh, not sustainable from a cost perspective. Uh, so we're looking at other options as it relates to that. Uh, but this also provides an additional 30 to 60 beds of non-congregate shelter for those who would otherwise be in encampments. I would say predominantly individuals that are experiencing unsheltered homelessness that are unlikely to go into a congregate shelter option choose these over that because um, this is more of a comfortable setting or it provides them access to have their pets or couples can stay together, whereas in a traditional shelter option, uh, that is not the case. I will mention that this site just opened um, at late December, early January of this, uh, of this year. Um, so currently we have uh, an emergency solutions grant COVID funding spend down that we have to adhere to uh, to be in compliance with our HUD guidelines. Uh, we have been allocated $5.4 million of ESG CV. Um, our, spend line, uh, our spend down is 80% by March 31st of 2022, and that's a 4.0, uh, about 4 million. <laughs> total, our total spend to date is about 2.7. So we have to spend about $1.33 million uh, by March 31st in order to be in accordance with our HUD guidelines. Right now we do have all of our service agreements that are going, but we do have some folks um, that are underperforming. And so we plan to reallocate those funds, which is about $485,000 to provide infrastructure costs for the tents and pallet shelters at the, uh, the new location um, and purchase 30 to 36 pallet shelters to be at that location as well. Um, I will mention that in 2021, we received almost double the amount of requests for services regarding encampments, vehicles, and RVs than in 2020. And so I would just like to put that out there as well in regards to um, the purchase and moving forward with these safe outdoor space sites. So um, with that, are there any questions? Some questions to staff? Yes, um, so you you said that July 2021 council approved the 30 pallet homes and the 30 tents. And then um, did you? Oh, go ahead. My, my apologies. I think that was more like October. We just had the tents right. operational starting in July. But yeah, I was going to say, um, I remember it being late. I think late October. So we did not actually use those until I think you said late December, early January. No, so we've been operating those for about um, since uh, they got put up. So I think we started in about November 1st is when they were operational. Um, and we've seen some great success with with having the pallet shelters um, okay. located at the, that site. Okay. But then then where did the average 80 to 90 days come from? Because basically November, December, we're not done with January. That So are they moving out at this point? So that's in totality of um, all of the sites. So when we're looking at safe parking, when we're looking at when we have the tents at the um, the Salvation Army location, uh -huh. and as they transition into pallet shelters, when we take all of those things together, we're seeing That's an average, average. Age in case. Okay, so that included the parking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, when we approved the pallet homes and the um, tents, it was for cold weather activation. So, are those going to close down April thirtieth? So right now, uh, with the pallet shelters that we have at the current location on the Salvation Army site, and the plan is no, it's on a temporary use permit now. So um, I don't, I don't foresee those shutting down at this point in time, particularly because we have a large um, uh, unsheltered population, and we really have uh, limited access to any sort of sheltering options for those folks. Okay, I was under the impression that we approved them based on cold weather activation because the. The discussion was how quickly can they be stored and put away? And it was kind of like, you know, there was a discussion of not getting any pallet homes because the tents were easier to store. Now I'm hearing we're not going to do away with them. We're going to keep them up permanently. I wouldn't say permanently. I would say definitely continuing on a temporary basis. I just know that we do need access to 
additional sheltering options for folks. If we took away the additional shelter options that we have placed uh, up in the city of Aurora right now, uh, we would be left with 130 to 150 beds at any given evening. And we have at least 600 people that would access shelter otherwise. So, so we, we don't, don't have, have we don't have 600. We don't have 600 folks that are using. We don't, but we're incrementally making strides to try to allow folks to, to access shelter and wraparound services. So they aren't in camping. So I guess I thought the cold weather activation with all this was because the day resource center takes people during cold weather, but because of COVID and the spacing, they were able to take less people. And I, I think that's why we ended up on this other path. Um, so I am concerned that it's going to be a permanent situation when I thought it was going to be temporary. So the tents that you said need heating, they only need heating when it's cold weather, not obviously when it's warm. That it, that would be correct, yes. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, I, I applaud you on the other successes of people getting unemployed or getting employment and also, um, you know, moving them out. So I do have a question. You said 42% success of permanent housing. And so how did they transition from tents sure. and pallet homes to the permanent housing? Is that something that we help them through grant programs to get rental assistance or? Yeah, so there was a variety of different ways. Part of it was employment uh, on their own. Um, by being able to stay in pallet shelters, they're able to save enough money in order to have the sustainability to be in a permanent housing solution. They worked very closely with case managers and housing navigators to get into a uh, deeply affordable unit um, to meet their need based upon their income. Um, I think that was another thing of navigating all of that. Um, and some did access grants uh, as well. So we have, uh, again, the emergency solutions grant, which offers um, homelessness uh, prevention as well as um, rapid rehousing dollars. And so that is helpful as well as our Aurora Flexible Housing Fund to, to help people get up on their feet. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. For, for other questions? Sunberg. Um, I'm uh, Councilmember McConnell and then uh, Councilmember Sunberg. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Lana, can you give us a uh, estimate as to when some of those funds are going to be repurposed for the expansion of uh, pallet shelters? And also, could you let us know um, the general sentiment, I guess, from both the folks that we are helping and also from the folks who are, are helping us help other folks about the effect efficacy of tents versus pallet shelters? Um, I would say that the individuals that are staying in that changed over from the tents to the pallet shelters, um, it was a really interesting dynamic because uh, they all showed up in the morning refreshed and ready to go to access service and to work with their case manager. Whereas before, um, the tents can still get really cold. They have a, a you know space heater. Their R value is is very low in the tents, and so um, you definitely see a larger uh, engagement with those folks that are in the pallet shelters because they can actually rest and sleep because they're not so cold that um, uh, you know it, it causes people to stay up and or do other things because they just can't get comfortable. Also, I would say the same thing. There were uh, a couple because we had a mild winter to start. Uh, we had a couple of warmer days, and they're equipped with air conditioning as well. So you see that exact. Um, connection uh, with the cold or with the warm weather as well. And I apologize, what was your first question again? Um, what is the ETA, I guess, if because I think I saw on one of the slides that we're going to look at repurposing low performing options, basically, and potentially expanding our pallet shelter inventory, right? I think to put over at the um, restoration site. Mm -hmm. So what's the ETA for that to happen? Yeah, so the purchase would have to occur prior to March 31st of this year. Um, I, the infrastructure for tents is something that we're looking at doing anyways because of the the astronomical electrical costs that are associated with it. And so um, our hope is to have something in place within the next two to three months. Great. And I guess my last um, question slash comment here, um, my understanding and my recollection rather is when we were discussing this originally, we were treating um, these as short to midterm, right? Like basically as an interim solution until sticks and bricks and more permanent supportive housing effectively can be built. Was that correct? 
Uh, yes, that was that was my intention for sure. Um, as far as that's concerned, just because we don't have the ability to build out something that would be appropriate for the population that we're seeing currently right, in, in the amount of time that we need to. All right. Thank you so much, Lana, for all your work. I appreciate it. You're welcome. For the further questions, staff. Uh, Sundberg. Uh, Council Member Sundberg. Hi, Lana. Uh, comment and a question. It's good to hear and see the numbers of those achieving employment and then transitioning out of there into something more permanent. And then a question regarding the $1,500 a week for heating, uh, is that propane or what's happening there with that high cost? Yeah, so those are just fuel costs to run the generator that they have rented. Yeah, so that's not even the rental cost for the generator itself, it's just fuel. Okay, just good old gas, huh? 1500 bucks. Thank you. You're welcome. Further questions of staff? Questions of staff. I was saying no, no, thank you for the update. Uh, consideration to appoint five members to the new Civic Engagement uh, Commission, uh, Katie uh, Rodriguez. Yes, Mayor, Council Members, this is the Civic Engagement Commission. It was approved by ordinance back in October 2020. The first round of appointments, according to the ordinance, shall be five members. They'll be appointed each year to a staggered three-year term until the <coughs> commission has that consists of 15 total members. So Carice is on the line. Their department are the ones who conducted and went through the interview process. If you have any questions. Uh, questions of staff. Uh, seeing none, uh, thank you very much for the update. Um, uh, uh, Katie, is there uh, action required on this 6A? Yes. Oh, very so well. Is there? Okay. Asking council to approve it to move forward to the next regular council meeting to appoint the first five okay. commissioners that are listed in the backup for recommendation. Okay. Is there any objection uh, from staff for, to move item number 6A forward? Uh, seeing none, item number 6A will move forward. Item number 6B proposed amendment to Aurora places to expand the planning and annexation boundary. Uh, Karen Han Hancock. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor Kaufman and City Council. I am Karen Hancock, and I am a, um, a long-range planner in the Planning and Development Services Department. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Tonight, I am presenting a proposed project to amend the city's comprehensive plan called Aurora Places um, to expand the city's planning and annexation boundary. The purpose of this boundary is to show the geography outside the city limits that may be considered for annexation. The statute um, that requires cities to plan for up to three miles outside of their incorporated boundaries in the jargon of state statute, this is called a plan in place. And Aurora's most current planning and annexation boundary was adopted into Aurora places in 2018. Aurora City Council has opted to expand and change the planning and annexation boundary many times since we were the town of Fletcher. I am quickly going to show an animation of how the boundary has changed over time since 1983. Um, and this animation will take approximately one minute. So, okay. So following the animation, I will briefly show five slides explaining the steps that we'll need to follow to be in compliance with city and state regulations if you all choose to move forward with the project. I expect you will have many questions following this brief presentation and I have a group of colleagues who will be available to answer your questions. So this is 1983 and the population was about 160,000. The orange color shows the incorporated city limits and the black line is the planning and annexation boundary. On this slide, the eastern extent uh, is Piccadilly Road. And on the south, that very southern border is Bellevue. The boundary mostly coincided with the city limits at that time. Blue lines were used to limit annexation so that Aurora Water had sufficient resources to serve the existing population. 
Um, and then let's watch, uh, and I'll show Piccadilly Road as we move through. So this is 1984. In 1984, the city absorbed the Sable Water District, and we chucked the blue lines and resumed annexations after a long hiatus. So let's go to 1986. And then less than two years later, Denver initiated the environmental impact statement for a new airport, which explains the large expansion on the northeast side of Den. And again, this is just for reference, Piccadilly Road, um, and the new southern boundary is now County Line Road. So let's move to 1989, population 222,000, following the release of the environmental impact statement for the new airport and the signing of the 1988 uh, intergovernmental agreement between Adams County and the new airport, Aurora further expanded the boundary to encompass the entire eastern side of Den to make sure that Aurora was poised to leverage economic activity associated with that new airport. And there's Piccadilly Road, so about halfway. So let's go to 1998. We can clearly see that the boundary on the north was adjusted. I did review the 1998 comprehensive plan, but it doesn't provide specific rationale for the adjustment. But Aurora Water at that time estimated that it could serve 350,000 uh, customers. So that's, again, Piccadilly. So let's go to 2003, population 280,000. When I started with the city in 2006, this is what our modern boundary looked like. The 2003 comprehensive plan includes policy for using fiscal impact analysis as a basis for expanding the boundary. Always in previous plans, water and growth went hand in hand, but in 2002, 2003, this, when this comp plan was being developed, we were in a vicious drought that resulted in our reservoirs being at 19% capacity. So growth couldn't happen without a solution to the water supply problem. Prairie Waters Project was conceived while staring at this very scary alternate future. Um, 2016, we had a population of 350,000 and Prairie Waters Project was a success, as we all know, and City Council once again considered expanding the planning, planning and annexation boundary. City Council instructed staff to prepare an amendment to the comprehensive plan accompanied by the required fiscal impact analysis. And after multiple presentations and discussions with council, staff was instructed to study um, expanding that 2009 boundary by 52 square miles, including state land board property. Um, and that was the East Aurora annexation study. So like the proposed project that I will present tonight, that request was sparked by an annexation inquiry for a property located just outside of the city's planning and annexation boundary. That amendment to the comprehensive plan was approved in 2016 and subsequently adopted into Aurora Places, our current comprehensive plan and approved by city council in 2018. So let's look at what I'm talking about tonight. This is proposed 2022. Um, we're proposing a project that would expand the city's planning and annexation boundary by another approximately square, uh, 12 square miles on the city's Northeast boundary. The geography shown is bounded on the North by 72nd Avenue and on the East Shoemaker Road, Schumacher Road. Okay, so let's slide one. Let's get this item on tonight's agenda. This is shows the page from Aurora Places where the city's current annexation boundary lives. The city was approached by a landowner just outside, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but just outside of the planning and annexation boundary up here. Um, but that landowner is not eligible to for annexation at this time. So as staff began discussions internally, uh, and with the landowner over more than two years, it became apparent that the time was ripe to bring a proposal to city council to review our current boundary and consider options for potentially expanding the boundary. And first, the geography shown bounded by this red dash line is the geography proposed by planning staff just to start the discussion. And this project is what long range planning is all about and will take a long look into the future uh, of the growth of the city, like 50 years or more for full build out. So an amendment to Aurora Places must be accompanied by a fiscal impact analysis to demonstrate how the properties within a geographic area might affect costs and revenues and impacts to current property owners, ratepayers, residents, and businesses. So slide two, how do we do a fiscal impact analysis? First, we need a land use plan, and there's really good news. We already have one, and it was prepared for the Colorado Air and Spaceport in 2021, and it's been peer reviewed by city staff and it's been adopted by Adams County Commissioners. And that sub area plan includes the geography I showed in the last slide, also shown in heavy red line on this slide. This plan includes compatible industrial and commercial uses that leverage the revenue generation from the two airports. The green area is classified as sustainable agriculture. 
And because of the influence of the airport slash spaceport in this area, land use is restricted to non-residential uses. And then the even better news is the last big expansion in 2016 left staff with a really good defensible template for future fiscal impact analyses. Regardless of the size of the geography included in the study, large or small, the cost to have a consultant run the model is about the same 24,000. The not so good news is that staff and all of our operations and service departments will need to review the 2015 costs from the last fiscal impact analysis and update them to 2020. 2021 numbers and for some departments, this is not a straightforward or quick task. So, um, when I managed the 2015 fiscal impact analysis study, 1 of my 1st questions was what does a fiscal impact analysis look like and what information does it provide? So, this is a uh, slide as an example from that 2015 impact analysis and the reminder. This proposed project that we're bringing to you tonight would only include analysis of non residential land uses. So it will look somewhat different, but this table helps us understand what the final product might look like. Staff will collect cost and revenue information from calendar year 2021 from an area already developed in the city. And we would use that information as a case study to base this fiscal impact analysis on. And then city council would be provided with a final uh, user friendly summary document that includes tables like these, along with a description of what's included and what tasks were performed to provide that information. Planning and economic growth issues are typically on PED agendas. So that's where we propose to take the updates. And this is a schedule. If you decide you want staff to proceed with this project, this slide provides a high level uh, schedule for what, what the task we need to do. Um, we would need as department staff would need su sufficient time to look uh, at the case study. Police, fire, pros, public works have already included the majority of this area in previous high level planning efforts. Aurora Water has not included this area and we'll need to identify the infrastructure required in the future water supply. But once the cost and revenue information has been provided by city departments, the data would be provided to the consultant who would then run the fiscal impact analysis model and that produces a work product like the table in slide 3. So stakeholder outreach is shown on the schedule in green and it includes check ins with council at PED and if requested study session to provide updates on progress and what we're hearing and from whom and updates would include letting you all know what case study in the city we plan to use and why. The fiscal impact analysis report will accompany a draft amendment to the Aurora Places, which you will all review. The amendment will look very much like the page from Aurora Places that I showed in slide one. And as for process, amendments to the comprehensive plan require two public hearings, one at the Planning and Zoning Commission and one at City Council. And according to the Unified Development Ordinance, or UDO for short, the Commission's recommendation will be um, provided to City Council along with the draft ordinance to adopt the amendment to Aurora Places. Amendments to the comprehensive plan can only be approved by with a supermajority of council votes, meaning seven of 10 council members and the mayor does not vote. So last slide. This is our staff's question for council is at the top of the slide, but um, I imagine you may have a lot of questions also. So also on the slide, I have provided the list of staff who are listening in and available to answer your questions. And that concludes my presentation. Ready to take any questions. Mayor. Uh, questions of staff, um, or Mayor Pertum. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation, Karen. Um, I was here when we did the Northeast annexation. Um, and I remember staff doing the, um, the fiscal analysis and it was showing a $15 million deficit in terms of city services that would have to be provided um, for allowing that um, that that annexation to happen because of the growth boundary that was already approved. So um, what we're doing now is contemplating moving the growth boundary and then any annexations would then come through at a different process through council. Um, so I definitely wanna see the fiscal impact analysis. And I guess my question is if they're currently not eligible for annexation because they're not in the growth boundary, what is the benefit to Aurora? Um, I mean, I get it that it's commercial industrial, but we don't get a whole lot of property taxes that typically goes to the schools and to the county. We only get about 10% from property taxes. So if it's not gonna be retail, we're not gonna have sales tax. 
um, I know we don't want, you just mentioned that basically it would be planned to, for not being residential, but what would stop someone from trying to annex in and then want residential and apply for that? Um, well, um, and I do have, I, I guess, um, I, they, it's not eligible for residential. Um, mainly because we have the noise and the ground rumble and all okay. those things, right? So um, I think the FAA would probably um, step in if we tried to put residential. So okay, that's number so that one. Wouldn't be a yeah, possible. It, it, it's not really feasible. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention um, is that um, our, my colleagues and I, uh, uh, we were on the steering committee for that Colorado Air and Spaceport um, sub area plan, and they very much want to leverage those airports there is going to be some um they, they're planning a lot of new things out at that and there's going to be land uses that could be compatible um you also have in that sustainable agriculture lots of things that can go in there that um would be uh like solar you know those kinds of things and then um we, we were talking about although we don't get a lot of revenue and we can talk about this more um fueling stations are you know are compatible um, and there's a lot of new types of fueling stations that might be compatible, especially with some projects that we've been looking at, other projects we've been looking at in this area. Um, so there's some new fuel types that are coming out. And so these are areas where you could put those kinds of land uses. So um, we would need to look at a case study and say, if we put these kinds of fueling stations or parking lots or solar, then we would come back and show that to you and say, this is what we're going to base it on. This is what we think this would look like. And then we would need to get your feedback if you think that we, you know, are providing that case studies, you know, that, that could get us the right numbers to show you. And then, of course, if it comes out negative like it did before, you yeah. know, we still went ahead with it because it still gives us options that we didn't have before. Um, and every single annexation and every single land plan you're going to review. <laughs> All right, and the and you said the water department has not um, made any comments at this point. Um, actually, I think if Sarah Young's on here, um, I think that's a really good question, and she has some feedback. So, Sarah, are you able to? to yeah, come on? good evening. Yeah, okay, um, thanks, City Council Mayor Pro Tem. So we haven't included, as Karen mentioned, we have not included this area in our planning studies at this point. Um, in the last integrated water master plan, we actually only included the annex properties within the planning boundary. Um, this version of the IWMP that we're getting started here quickly, um, if this were to move forward, we would include that boundary and we plan to include everything within the planning area boundary, less things like the state land board land and such to understand what the full picture of water supply looks like for any property that has the potential to annex. So you would look at water supply, but you would also look at what infrastructure is needed in terms of pipelines, lift stations, that type of thing. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Well, I, um, I think this is, um, this is just a first step uh, in terms of, uh, ex you know, expanding the growth boundary, uh, doing the economic analysis, uh, as Steph said, it in no way, as Karen said, it in no way uh, commits the the uh, city council uh, to to annex uh, to bring that land into Aurora, but but it starts the process where we can formally look at it. And so uh, I strongly support. I think that there's some going to be some potentially incredible commercial development around uh, spaceport that Aurora can capitalize on. Uh, further questions to staff, Mayor. Uh, Councilmember McConnell. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I guess I'll start with a comment. Um, I agree. I think that it doesn't hurt to take a look at the potential cost benefit of this area. Um, but I do have a question for staff um, and a concern um, that I think in the past, uh, I remember I was actually you know present and testified during the East Aurora annexation hearings. Uh, it seemed to me that some of that process was actually being driven by landowners who were hoping to basically make money off of being annexed into the city. So basically land speculators who are effectively just rent seeking um, and make future development more expensive. And what do we have in place to ensure that that doesn't happen with this specific you know, area that we're looking at? 
because uh, you know affordable housing is important, obviously, but affordable commercial space and industrial space matters too. So if we have folks, you know, arbitrarily increasing the cost of development um, through a speculative process, I'd like to be able to combat that so that we can actually, you know, make it easier for folks to actually do business in the city in that way. And I would just say that um, the fiscal impact analysis policy that we talked about that they put in that 2003 comp plan we've carried over through the UDO is exactly for that reason. Um, and we did not have the UDO when, in 2015. And mm -hmm. so we've strengthened a lot of that language so that you do all have that ability to look in and weigh in and have check-in points with staff. Um, and that came about as a result of um, trying to do it for the first time in 2015 for, for such a large area. We learned a lot. So I'll just say we, we, had a really, we have a really good model. Um, so uh, you'll get to see it. You'll get to see it and you'll get to make your decisions. So um, it's a great point. That was a, that was a difficult uh, process back then. Yeah. So, Mayor. Please proceed. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Karen, I just want to get clarification then make sure I'm understanding that you're going to work in some kind of speculative angle, you know, to combat speculation really as part of this. I don't think I quite heard the answer to that. So, well, it, and I, I guess I was thinking case study. Um, speculative for the East Aurora annexation study. And if we're looking, it is kind of a little bit of an apples to oranges situation because that was such a large area and included a, a, such a large amount of uh, residential. Mm -hmm. um, and to your point on affordable commercial and all of that, um, those land uses are probably gonna go in that area whether they're in Aurora or not. So, you know, when, when the airports develop out. So that case study to show you what it, we could, choose and to your point one that includes some of the small businesses maybe we are looking at some of those types of things when we look at a case study so what we would need to do is figure out those things and bring it back to you and i have to say um we haven't done it before we have not done a non-residential fiscal impact analysis we all have opinions on what it might be depending on which department you're going to be in um, and I don't know if it's negative, positive, or neutral until we get that case study and look at it. But what we would like is to bring it back to you with check-in points um, because it's new to us and it's new to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Karen. I appreciate it. Further yeah. questions, staff? Sorry. Council Member Mario. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Karen, for the presentation. The, the visual is really helpful. Um, so... Am I understanding this correctly that this was this process was initiated because a developer approached us about annexing their particular property into Aurora? Yes, um, that's usually an impetus. And um, if you'd like to know more about this specific inquiry, I have Jacob Cox on the line and he's he's in ODA and he'll be able to kind of tell tell you about that touch point. Um, but that's usually what sparks it is a landowner and it's not a developer, it's a landowner. Um, and then of course, you know, from your experience with annexation and you've been on the council long enough to know that they can approach us. It's up to you whether you accept their annexation petition, so. Sure, um, and well, let me let me finish my train of thought and maybe that will clarify if, if that needs a response or not. So, you know, I guess the, the question before us is, um, does council wish to proceed with developing the amendment to the city's comprehensive plan uh, to expand the city's planning and annexa annexation boundary, including preparing a 2021 fiscal impact analysis? So I guess my, I'm not opposed to a fiscal analysis. I think that is the responsible thing to do, right? Understanding it, including kind of the water impacts. I think that's really critical. I um, am a little confused well, maybe I'm confused. Does it have to include, does this fiscal impact equal um, initiating um, the amendment to uh, increase or expand our planning boundary? Can they live independently? I just, I have a, I guess it's, I don't know, I guess I have a little heartburn that we're doing this because a develop, you know, a landowner wants to annex into Aurora, not necessarily wrong, but could lead to speculative development, right? Like, what are we gaining in return? Why do, can we do this fiscal impact without initiating that amendment? Because I want to know the data before agreeing to that process. I just, 
do those things have to happen together? Can they be divorced from another one from one another? And I can tell you, in when we did the 2015, 2016, we brought the fiscal impact analysis first. And when we were told to, to move forward, then we brought a, a, an amendment to the composite plan. But for us staff to be in compliance with the UDO, we have to have the fiscal impact analysis first. So to your question, let's look at that first. And the amendment to the comprehensive plan is not rocket science. You saw my slide one with the map, that's, that's it. Um, and that puts us in compliance with state statute. And so we need that adopted into our plan, but the fiscal impact analysis is what you're gonna be making your decisions on. Okay, so it's, it is separate. We would, we really are just voting on the fiscal impact, not necessarily to initiate the process to annex or include a larger boundary um, in our annex. Okay. And, that, and the, money, is... the money that we talked about, the cost of it, that is just for the fiscal impact analysis. Everything else will be done by staff in-house. Okay, good. Cause I, yeah, that was, that was my main issue. I don't love that, although I know it's common, I don't love that we're initiating costs for the city for, for a land owner to potentially benefit from that um, at this, you know, so I wanna make sure that if that's what's gonna happen, that we have the information before initiating that process and that they're separate. Karen, doesn't the landowner pay for the cost of the economic study? Um, that is, um, they have not in the past, the city has done that, but that is, to you all, how you want to do that, um, the financial part of it. I'm just offering you the cost tonight. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Ross. And yeah, I want to, I remember back then, because I was one of the ones who was not, uh, I was opposed to the annexation that one because that study was so expensive and we didn't even really utilize that study. So I want to make sure on this one that we're being, you know, fiscally responsible on the study that we're actually going to use for this economic impact. Because I know that was one of my arguments back in 2015. <laughs> Mayor. Uh, Councilmember McConnell. Thank you, sir. And yes, I remember Councilmember Bergen and Councilmember Lawson, you were both against that annexation. I testified we were all on the same side on that one. Um, so I want to, uh, I think, maybe suggest uh, since uh, this landowner, they're not a developer. So what that means to me is there's probably not even a plan for any kind of use of the land in the immediate term, at least. Um, since it seems to me like this is like a speculative endeavor, if they would like to cover the costs for the study, I'd like to propose that. And I was just reminded that our UDO does specify that uh, although the city is the, um, we are the ones that do the fiscal impact analysis so that there's a little bit of a barrier there that they are supposed to pay for that. So um, I'll thank my colleague for reminding me that. Okay, so the, so the landowner will pay for the, the economic study? Yes. Okay, so, okay then, done. Uh, further uh, questions of staff? Uh, seeing none, uh, uh, is there any objection uh, uh, to moving item number 6B forward? Uh, seeing none, item number 6B will move forward. Thank you, Karen. Uh, item number 6C, uh, review outside agency appointments. Uh, okay, <laughs> it's gonna be a little while. Um, I'm gonna go over each one. Um, Accelerate Colorado, uh, Marsha Burzins, uh who was a representative there. And um, is there anyone who desires to serve on Accelerate Colorado? I do. Uh, mayor Pro Tem, uh, is there any objection to having the Mayor Pro Tem serve on Accelerate Colorado? Uh, seeing none, uh, she will then uh, serve uh, in that capacity. Adams County Aging Network. Um, Renee uh, Keener, and then a vacancy. Let's see. Okay, so that, um, uh, Katie, that's not, or or Nancy, that's not, that doesn't necessarily uh, require a member of council, correct? Is there anybody on staff that can answer that question? Yeah, I believe Patty Varney is on the line. She's in the mayor council. Okay, Patty. 
Um, I'm not familiar with Renee Keener. Um, I could follow up on that um, on that for you, Mayor. Um, well, let me. Okay, thank you. Is is there anybody on council that wishes to serve uh, on the uh, Adams County Aging Network? Okay, I'm uh, seeing that. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't want to serve on it, but I I thought it was always just city staff. Oh, that serve on that. I think so. If yeah. I remember. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, Councilor Coombs. Mayor, I was just indicating that, yeah, we've had in the past staff, I've actually attempted in the past to try to get in touch to be involved and it has been difficult. So at this point, I'm okay with just letting staff continue to serve that function. Very well. Um, uh, is there any objection uh, to staff doing that? I see none. That will be a staff. Those will be staff positions. Adams County Airport Coordinating Committee. Uh, Councilmember Gruber held that uh, position. Um, uh, four seats for elected two seats for elected officials. I meet on an as needed basis. Uh, did, does anybody uh, wish to serve in that capacity? Mayor, I would like to serve on that. Councilmember Gardner, is there is there anybody else? Very well, then, uh, Councilmember Gardner will serve on that position. Is there any objection? Seeing none, uh, then it will be Councilmember Gardner. Um, Adams County Economic Development, ACED. Um, let's see, one seat for an elected official. Uh, Councilman Gruber has served on that before. Myself is the alternate. Uh, does anybody wish to serve in that capacity? Uh, then I'll I'll serve in that. Um, is there any objection to having me serve on it since nobody else wants to? Okay. Uh, Rapo County Community Corrections Board. Um, council makes a recommendation. Okay, it doesn't look like uh, an elected official has to do that, but there, is there anybody who wants to do that? Okay. Uh, Rural Economic Development uh, Council. So we're we losing Council Member Burzens. Um, let's see. Uh, and then Council Member uh, Bergen's term is up. Curtis Gar. Um, let's see. Council Member Bergen, do you want to, Mayor Pretend Bergen, did you want to be reappointed to that? If I could, please. Okay. Is there any objection? Seeing Mayor, none that. I would also like to be on that one. Okay, Council Member Jurinsky. Um, Mayor. Okay, uh, yeah. Murillo. Murillo, okay, let me watch here. No, 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 I actually just had a comment. So I okay, am please. not currently serving on the AEDC board, but I'm not going to be seeking reappointment. I just okay. can't make the commitment work with my full time. They, they have a very specific time and date, and it worked for a while while it was virtual, but that's no longer an option. So I'd rather give somebody the the opportunity who who has the time and capacity. I'm generally just reviewing my time commitment. So that's, I won't be seeking reappointment. Okay, now well, are all these positions, how many do we have? Oh, eight Six. seats, yeah. two elected, two seats are ex officio, mayor and chair of PD. Okay. So mayor, just sorry. Yes. Really, but, uh, Council member Jarinski automatically gets to be on it because okay. he's the chair of PED. So, and then there are six seats still, um, I guess, well. Six more, wow, gosh. Okay, so, Council, I'm sorry, um, who was that? Zavonic, I'll do it. Okay, Council Member Zavonic. Mayor, okay. ask when it meets, maybe uh, Council Member Murillo would know. Uh, um, it's four it times meets quarterly. Quarterly? Quarterly. Mm -hmm. So I don't have the exact dates. It just and, it wasn't working for me. They're always they're almost always downtown Denver, and they're um, two hours three o'clock to five o'clock, if I recall mm. correctly. Okay. Um, I can so, step in there. I'll, I'll I'll step in, guys. Okay. Mayor, my it says my term expires twenty twenty three, but I'd like to continue and, unless whatever. Okay, very well. Okay, you'll continue then. Well, you, we'll deal with yours next year, I guess. 
Um, okay, so we've got um, Council Member Jarensky is ex officio. Council Member Zavonic then is going to serve. Council Member Sundberg is going to serve. I think we need one, uh, and Council Member Bergen is going to continue serving. So I think we need, we still have um, one other opening. Or Council Member Lawson, what do you want to do? Okay, I'll serve. <laughs> okay, then we've got six. Then it's six. Okay. I'll serve. I was giving someone else another opportunity. So there we go. Okay. Going on, so. Okay, I know you do. Okay, Aurora Housing Authority. Um, those are all mayoral appointments, um, and I don't. Those don't involve elected officials. Mayor. Okay. Yes. I did notice that it said there could be up to one city official and none of the folks currently on their city officials. So I just wanted to flag that, that we could potentially have someone from council or other city. Officials. Okay. I don't think we, there, there's nothing up right now. Mayor, are you on it? Yes. Well, no, I'm not on it, but I make the appointments. Oh. It's, it's, I think it's the only thing I make unilateral appointments on, but, but there are no, no, none of the terms are coming up right now. Uh, Aurora Mental Health, uh, Marsha Burzins uh, did that. Uh, board meets, da da da. So, um, I don't see that it, so it, it, it doesn't require an elected official, but an elected official can serve. Does anybody wish to serve? I can do it if you want. Okay. Um, Council Member Sunburn. Uh, that's Medina. Oh, Medina. Okay. Councilmember Medina. Thank you. Uh, any objection? Uh, seeing none, Councilmember Medina will take Councilmember Burson's place. Aurora Sister Cities, um, Councilmember um, Marcano's term is coming up. Is up. <laughs> um, Councilmember Marcano, do you wish to continue serving? I do. I very much enjoy the committee. So Very well. Is there any objection to Councilmember um, Marcano continuing? Seeing none, Council McConnell will continue um, for another term. A Centennial Airport Community Noise Roundtable. I just want to say, uh, I don't th think this requires an elected official. And I want to say that former Councilman Brad Pierce has done an incredible job. Karen Hancock is certainly good, but as a volunteer, Brad Pierce has done an amazing job. Um, and it doesn't, look, it doesn't look like there's terms that expire. Uh, on that. Uh, Chair Creek Basin Water Quality Authority. Uh, Mayor Portel, I know, uh, wants to continue. No, I'm actually, I'm actually not on it. Um, oh, you're not? No, that's a mistake. I was on it the year before in mm -hmm. 2020, but in 2021, it was um, Council Member Coombs. Yeah, it's okay. I have a conflict with Mile High. Okay. Uh, Council Member Coombs, what do you want to do? Unfortunately, I've had a number of conflicts between Visit Aurora and my day job with that. It's a Thursday morning meeting, mm -hmm. and, and Visit Aurora meets on the same Thursday, and then sometimes those meetings are all day um, rather than just in the afternoon. So that's been an issue as well as, again, my job. So okay. if somebody is there anyone else, like to else on, is there anybody on the water committee that could serve? Well, they say, okay, there is one elected official position on the board. Yeah, I mean, it's important that we have someone because yes. we're allocating funds that are contributed to by the city of Aurora and also um, that are paid by Aurora residents who are within the oh. district. Um, so if I could make it consistently, I would stay on. It's interesting and very important, but I just can't, I have several conflicts. And so I don't want to end up not being there. But it would be good if someone who is on the water policy committee could serve on it. Okay, do we have a volunteer? <laughs> Sorry, which one are we on now? Pardon me. Uh, Cherry Creek Basin Water Quality Authority. <clears throat> is it, is it oh, so, okay, it meets once a month. On the third Thursday. Yep. At okay. Nine a.m. Okay. Councilmember Sunberg. 
behind me. <laughs> okay, pace yourself. Um, okay, Council Member Summary. Any objection? So you know, Council Member Summary. Cherry Creek Basin Water Quality Authority Technical Advisory Committee. And let's see if it requires an elected official. No, that one's staff. That one's staff. Okay, no, it does not. Colorado Municipal League uh, Policy Committee, Angela Lawson, term uh, has not expired yet. Mayor, and I still would like to keep on that committee because I'm okay. very involved in that. So I guess when it comes up for reappointment, mm -hmm. I'll still apply. Um, let me ask staff, um, in these situations where this is coming up in June, uh, do we make a decision now or do we make a decision in June? This is Roberto. We make a decision in June on CML. That's one of the only ones that's off cycle, but we come, we bring it back to you to study session in the summertime. Okay. Okay, it looks like uh, Colorado Air and Space Port Advisory Board. Uh, I don't believe that that requires an elected official. But is there anyone who wishes to take Council Member Gruber's place? Again, not an elected official, not required. Gruber like stay. What's that? I'm sorry. Would hey, Gruber stay on? You know what? I may. Uh, is there any objection to having asking uh, Dave Gruber to continue uh, in that capacity? If not, I will do it because uh, it, it, it does say it may overwork customarily is city representative, but. Uh, is there any objection from my asking uh, Council Member Gruber, given his um, aviation background? Okay, um, I will do so then. Uh, Mile High Behavioral Healthcare, uh, Comitis Crisis Center, Allison Coombs. Um, yes, I'd like to continue if that's all right. Okay, is there any objection to having uh, Council Member Coombs continue? I'm seeing none, she'll continue. Um, Denver Regional Council of Governments, Allison Coombs, um, and we'll, I, I do not want to be the alternate on that. Um, and we have Angela. So let's see, what are the requirements? Uh, one seat for an elected official on the board of directors. Mayor. Yeah, Mayor. so I want to stay on as the primary person. Okay. Uh, Councilor uh, Montano? Mayor, I, yeah. yes, sir. I'm uh, sorry, who? I wanted to clarify so um on here for the arapaho county transportation subcommittee it lists jeff baker that's actually currently me um, where is that i'm sorry so that's uh so under dr cog there's oh i see okay i'm okay. actually the uh person there not jeff so and do you want to continue uh, in that capacity I, I would like to and unless there's other interest if you don't want to be the alternate i'm happy to take alternate as well okay and mayor and just to just to coincide with that yeah, i still mayor. want to the Dr. Cog Adams County Tr Transportation Subcommittee, but I do need a, also an alternate for that committee. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, okay, oh, so, um, you were referring to the, okay. Okay, um, uh, Angela Loss, okay, so uh, on Dr. Cog, Rappo County Transportation Subcommittee is gonna be Council Member McConnell. And then on, uh, uh, Dr. Clark, Adams County Transportation Subcommittee is going to be Councilmember Lawson, but you need an alternate uh, alternate as well. I do need an alternate for that committee. Who's willing to? Who would like to be the alternate for the Adams County Transportation Subcommittee? It's a really good committee. <laughs> there we go. We got a sales job going here. <laughs> Meet Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> five thirty. Oh no, five thirty. Okay. Yeah, it's anybody? a nice time one. <laughs> so. Okay. Is there anybody who would be willing to do that? Mayor, this is Zivonic. I don't want to uh, as, as much of a, a sales job as Angela or Councilmember Lawson just did. I actually, if there is this, and I don't know if you said there's one or two seats on that actually on Dr. Cog, but I would like to serve on Dr. Cog if there is. Uh, let's see, one seat for one. I don't think. There's just the one. So there's just one. Yeah. yeah. I can be the yeah, alternate. I can be the alternate. Some pretty strict voting requirements on that. So I'm sorry, Council Member Medina. I can Are be the alternate on the Adams County Thank you. Thank you, okay. Council Member Medina. So, Mayor. <laughs> yes. When we've Walker. had two people in the past ask for the same committee, um, how do we deal with that? Because well, Council Member Medina is going to be the alternate. No, no. Council Member Zavonik and Council Member Coombs both want to be on Dr. Cog. Okay, uh, Council Member Zavonik, you want to be on Dr. Cog? Mm hmm I do. Okay, we're going to have to uh, then decide. 
Um, uh, let me um, go through the, the roster then. Um, you guys know the time commitment because it's evening, right? Yes. Yes, yeah, so it's Wednesday. Wednesday evenings. And then there's also Wednesday afternoon um, th on the second um, week. So there's the um, kind of similar to our study sessions that meet once monthly. And then there's also the yeah. actual Dr. So, Song meetings. And then I'm also on the Finance and Budget Committee, and my term for that expires next year. Okay, so. Um, and so there's a primary and there's an alternate. Uh, and I've been the alternate. Correct. So, Councilman uh, Zemanik, is your desire to be the primary or the alternate? I can be the alternate. Okay, very well. Then it's resolved. Is there any objection uh, to having uh, Councilmember Coons be the primary, Councilmember Zemanik being the alternate? Nope. Okay, seeing none, that's what we'll do. Okay. Uh, E470 authority. Um, so we had. Do you. Um, Councilmember Bergen, do you uh, need an alternate? Um, we don't need one, but um, if someone wants to be. Um, okay. So we meet the um, typically the second Thursday of the month, sometimes also the fourth Thursday of the okay. month. And then we have subcommittees as well. And I okay. just got elected as vice chair of the executive committee. Okay, great. So you want to continue on? Yes. <laughs> okay. And then uh, um, who would like to be the alternate? For E four seventy, I will be Jurinsky. Okay, um, Jurinsky. Can I make a suggestion, Mayor? Yes. So E four seventy. Well, I mean, if Councilmember Jurinsky wants to do it, but typically, um, because E four seventy is in Ward two, we sometimes try to get that person, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I think okay. so. But on like three committees tonight already. Yeah, I, I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> nice try. So okay, okay. So um, Fitzsimmons uh, Redevelopment Authority, which is um, really uh, Fitzsimmons uh, Innovation uh, uh, Campus uh, now, or for, or it says for marketing purposes. Uh, I wish to continue. Uh, we have two. Let's see. Um, see, she'll have three representatives on the board. So I will need two other uh, representatives then to take Marsha Burson's and Allison Hills's place. Mayor, I'd like to serve on FRA. Council Member Gardner, uh, anybody else? No, when this one meets. Um, Wednesday at three thirty. I'm also yeah. interested. What's that? I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, this is Councilor Marcano. So it's the fourth Wednesday at three thirty p.m. Um, I am also interested in this. Um, okay. Yeah. Anyone, is there anyone else interested? Okay. I was kind of interested, but we already have what? Uh, Council Member Gardner. I thought Council Member Lawson was interested. And then. I was, I mean, I am interested, but. Um, <laughs> So I'll I'll back out since there's. Let me just say this is a, I mean this is a pretty yeah, the, yeah it's pretty heavy time commitment and there's a lot of extra meetings outside of the primary meetings. Yeah, I just uh, I'm capped. <laughs> okay, so uh, is there any objection to Councilmember Gardner and Councilmember McConnell, uh, and myself? Okay, very well. Do you want it? Are you? Do you want? I'm sorry. It? Um, no, I I think I'm tapped. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Laurie Redevelopment Authority. Now, I thought, let me ask a question to Sam. I thought this uh, it was dissolved. Could staff respond? Patty? I am not familiar with that. I was hoping Roberto might direct me. I did get, a, did get I got a, I got a hard copy letter. Um, Mayor, we did. Mayor, you're okay. correct. We did get we did get notice that uh, of the intent to redissolve the authority. We can confirm with them if we okay. need to have representatives as they go through the uh, the dissolution process. But we'll we'll get back to council on that. Okay, one. thank you, Council Member McConnell. Thank you, sir. I apologize. I misread my calendar. Uh, the three thirty slot actually overlaps with one of the policy committees I'm on. Um, so if someone else wants to do FRA. Um, I think that'd be easier than potentially reworking three of our schedules. 
Yes. Okay. What time uh, does we'll, it start, Mayor? What time does it start on Wednesdays? I think three thirty. Yeah. Thirty. Okay. In, in going it. back to the uh, Lowry, uh, I'm sorry, Mayor, this is Jack Bajork from the City Attorney's Office. Sure. Uh, the Lowry Redevelopment Authority uh, has noticed uh, for dissolution, but that won't happen until the end of 2022. So we still need members on that. On okay. That. Um, one parent points to, oh, so that doesn't necessarily mean Elected, you don't have to be elected officials to do that, right? Um, I just as soon have the, the people that are on there continue uh, on there. Is there any objection to that? It's, I, I just don't think it's of much significant since it's being phased out. Okay, um, we have to go back into um, the FRA, uh, tell me who would like to be on the, let me tell you what, what it's amazing. Uh, it's, it's a lot of economic development in the biotech space yep. is effectively what it is. Did, but I will let, if council member Lawson would prefer, I would let her do that choice. Well, Mayor, do you have a preference? It seems like you might have someone that you want on this board. No, I think uh, um, I'm, I'm open. Whichever one of you two of you want to do it. Council Member Gardner wants to do it, and so I just need a third person. But it is, it is a, um, it, it definitely is a time commitment. Well, I'll see if anybody else wants to do it. Okay. Biotech's really fascinating area. I actually have a background in lab design, so that's why I was going for yeah. it. But Mayor, I just I I can look on my calendar because I thought I might have a uh, conflict on that Wednesday. I don't, and I I would be happy to do it if uh, Councilmember Lawson or Bergen don't want it. I'm, I'm happy to start. Okay. I, I will give it to you, ca um, Councilmember Zavonic. <laughs> okay, Councilmember Zavonic and Councilmember Gardner and myself. Okay, let's see. We're Lowry Community Advisory Committee. Um, again, I don't think that requires any. Um, an elected official, and I, we've already got people on, and I just, I think everybody's pretty, got a lot of commitments right now, so without objection, I just think we just should continue this uh, group of people. Uh, Metro uh, Wastewater Reclamation District Board of Directors um, does not require an elected official, and so uh, my suggestions would be to continue with the appointments. Isn't that one the one that's automatically the mayor pro tem, or am I thinking something else? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, isn't that? Are we on Mile High? Uh, Metro Wastewater. No, that's, yeah, the the one the one that the mayor pro tem normally sits on is the Mile High Flood Control District Mayor. Okay. Okay. National organization to ensure a. Is that, oh, that's it's. <coughs> uh, that's at the end. Let me see here. Um, and, and Mayor, I just wanted to see if Council Member Coombs wanted to take my position at the Highline Canal collaboration. I know she was interested in that. Council Member Coombs, or you wanted to be an alternate? Um, yeah, if there's, if either there's an alternate or if you want to step off that one, I'd be happy to step up. Okay, I'll step off. Am I that. missing a, I might be missing a page soon. Oh, Mayor, it's right after the Fitzsimmons redevelopment on page 363. I don't know if you have it printed out, but it's right after that one. Okay. I'm canal collaboration. Oh, I see. Okay. So and I'm going to um, give that over to Council Member Coombs. Council Member Coombs, you want to take that one? Yeah. Oh, very well. Okay, and I guess I serve honorary chair. Um, Council Member, okay, Council Member Coombs in. Uh, we'll take Council Member Lawson's place. Okay. Okay. Um, so I-70 Regional Economic uh, Advancement Partnership. Uh, Council Member Gruber had that. Looks like it doesn't require an elected official. Um, was anybody, does anybody want to do it? Uh, if not, I'll ask Council Member Gruber if he'll continue on. Just, okay, somebody wants to do it, I'll ask Council Member Gruber. Um, Aerotropolis Regional Transportation Authority, this is pretty important. Um, Council Member Gardner, do you want to be the principal? Uh, yes, I'd like that. 
Okay. Do we need an alternate alternate on that? Let's see. There are actually two positions. Yeah, we do need an alternate because we have two voting positions. Okay. So, so it, well, th then you, it's just a two people positions then? We should appoint a second position because currently the board is two Adams County commissioners, two okay. four city council members, and a fifth. Well, who else wishes to be on the Aerotropolis Regional Transportation Authority? What does the time commitment look like for that? It's um, every other Wednesday um, from 11 to 1. Is that as necessary or is that every other Wednesday? Since, I, since I've served, it's been every other Wednesday, though we've we recently issued bonds, and so we've gone through quite a bit lately. It may not always be like that, but that's I think what you should expect is at least two hours every other Wednesday. It's, um, I believe, I'm just looking at my calendar. It's the second and the fourth Wednesday. Unfortunately, that'll overlap with one of my other um, committees. Does anybody else wish to serve on this? I will if no one else is going to do it. But okay. I'm not, wait a minute. What? When do they meet? Sorry, say that again. It's the second and fourth Wednesdays from eleven to one, and it's usually the whole two hours. Okay. What it is. Councilmember Sunberg, that's in your ward. It, it, was he not interested? I am um, interested. I'm trying to make sure. Yeah. Two, two oh, that no, was just hard, especially at the beginning of being on council. We can't, do, we can't do two plus an alternate. You you can do an alternate. Uh, Adams County does uh, do alternates, so you, if, what, if council wait, wishes, you could do an alternate. Wait, okay. Why don't um, Steve? Why don't you take it and then I'll be your alternate okay okay right? i'll try that okay <laughs> unless unless zavonic wants it no i i i'm i'm worried about the the back to back on that wednesday um with fra too and just having an entire wednesday shot up with back to back board meeting so <laughs> um it doesn't have to be um doesn't look like it. Well, does it require an elected official? I don't see it in the description. Doesn't appear to. But historically, it's been elected official. Oh, so we could put like Jason Bachelor on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask. Uh, is the um, Patty? What is a? Uh, is it? Does this uh, require an elected official? It doesn't say in the description. I would think that it would. I mean, this is this is pretty weighty stuff. Yeah, I can't speak to whether or not it's specifically required, though my recommendation based on the participation, I would strongly encourage council to have representation. Okay, let's go. It's, it's pretty weighty stuff. I think it really does require an elected official. Yeah. These are big policy matters. Okay, so we have um, uh, Council Member Gardner, and we have... Um, Council Member Sunberg, and then we have Council and the Mayor Pro Tem as an alternate. I see enthusiasm in that shoulder shrug. <laughs> okay, is that what we got? Where where are we at here? I didn't see any other takers. Okay, uh, so is there any objection to sticking them with this? Okay, um, okay, the uh, Sand Creek Regional Greenway. Um, I suggest uh, if Councilman Laguerre is willing to do it, that certainly doesn't require an elected official. Okay. Spirit of, of Aurora. Uh, um, I don't, who, so it's vacant now. Um, it has if, been, we usually have had a council member on it in past years. I was on it one year. Um, honestly, this needs to be revitalized. This needs. To okay. Uh, does anybody want to do this? I was thinking about it until I got roped into a couple more things. Yeah. <laughs> I knew they do. Um, May I ask a question? Is is every sure. council member serving on at least two things here? I'm serving. Just... On that. <laughs> what, what is the time commitment on that? For the days. It's not very often. I don't even think they meet monthly, it, honestly. It might even be quarterly, perhaps on a Thursday, if I remember correctly. Um, 
Okay. I think I council can... members Marie. Uh, I think uh, with council member Medina, I see him uh, raising his hand there. Team. Council member Medina, can you do this? I can do it. I can try it. So. Okay, council member Medina. Any objection? Seeing none. Okay, urban drainage and flood control. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know what. Uh, flood control action district board of directors. Um, it's now called Mile High Flood District. Okay, and unfortunately, I do have to stay on it. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's one of my responsibilities as mayor pro tem. Yeah, a national organization to ensure a sound controlled environment. Noise. I'm surprised. It seems like there's two that are fairly close. <laughs> That, that are involved in uh, aviation noise, right? Am I right in that? What, what's the other one? And I know the other one is... Um, the other one is the Centennial Airport um, Noise Committee. Okay. You know what? I would tell you, I, I um, Karen, see, I don't think it requires an elected official. And I got to tell you, Brad Pierce has done such an extraordinary job on the... Um, on the other one, I would think that he would be willing to do this one too. Karen, has Brad been on this before? This national organization, I thought he was currently on it, but it says uh, Dave Gruber. You know, I think that that's wrong. I think that we looked at putting Dave Gruber on it, but Dave Pierce wanted to, con I mean, um, is it Dave? Brad. Brad Pierce wanted to continue. I and so I left Brad Pierce on there. I think Brad is just on the Cackner, the Centennial Airport one. I don't think he's on the noise. No, I, I think he, I really think he, well, anyway, um, this is pretty time consuming. And uh, I, I think Brad has a real interest in this area. So if there's no objection, I'd like to reach out to uh, Brad. Uh, Karen, is, is Karen Hancock uh, on? Probably not. Okay, but I know. Um, is there any objection to me? Is anybody wants to do it? If not, I'd like to reach out to Brad Pierce. Mayor. Yes. No, I'm not volunteering to be on it. Has everyone on council um, volunteered to be on an outside board? Yes. <laughs> is there anybody that is? Because I mean, some of us are doing five committees. Yeah. I'm on five. Year, I'm currently not on any boards, but that was intentional, just trying to manage my capacity. Um, so I'm just being pretty straightforward as a, as a part time council member. That's not something, you know, that I can really entertain at this time. Okay. Um, well, I think we're done there. Um, if, if no one wants to do the, uh, the noise, um, again, I'd, I'll reach out to uh, Brad Pierce. Okay. Excuse me, Mayor. Yes. We do have one more to add. We have Visit Aurora that was not um, on this original list. Currently, oh, okay. we have uh, Council yeah, Member Coombs. I was ask you about that. I would like to stay on that. Okay. Is there any objection to having Council Member Coombs stay on Visit Aurora? And seeing none, Council Member Coombs will then stay on Visit Aurora. Is, I have a question. Is that just one, one person? Uh, yeah, the mayor is, I think, an ex officio member as well, or has some kind of automatic well, role as mayor. But there's one. Council well, it's, uh, it, can I hear from staff on that? Because I, because I, I don't have a description of it in front of me. That was actually added last mayor. last minute by Bruce Dalton, and he did not provide any details at this time. But he has a mayor as the ex officio? He did not indicate that. He just indicated that uh, Council Member Coombs was the current um, uh, representative. Okay, then uh, Council Member Coombs will continue. Um, I'm sorry, please. It's yes. Kim Stewart. Okay, Kim. The Communications and Marketing Director for the City of Aurora is the ex officio member. Okay. Uh, because of the relationship and they're a destination marketing organization. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, so good. I, I serve that role, but I imagine they would be flexible. It would require, I think, a bylaws change from Visit Aurora. I, I think you're fine staying on that. <laughs> uh, okay, but I, that, that makes sense from a communications marketing standpoint. Um, uh, Mayor, I, I, 
want to just add real quick. I trust that staff will be able to produce a summary, uh, an updated list here. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, uh, item number 7A, uh, recreation update, uh, recreation center winter break programs and expo uh, Meadowood uh, Community Center uh, usage, uh, Joe Sack. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I am uh, sharing my screen. Can you all see that? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. How about now? There we go. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I am Joe Sack, the Recreation Services Manager from the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Open Space. I'm here tonight to provide an informational update on the recent winter break program and the current usage of Expo and Meadowood Community Centers. To get started with, uh, we'd like to define some terms and our define our usage. Um, we have drop-in usage, which is unscheduled paid admissions to access the facilities. These could be annual passes, six month passes, punch passes, and then also paid uh, daily admission. We also have scheduled registration-based program to access an activity. This would be somebody registering for a class, like in Perfect Mind, um, uh, be, being able to do that online or in person. We also have a couple of different types of facilities that we have. We have recreation centers, which are full service facilities that include multiple amenities, such as gymnasiums, pool, uh, fitness area, conference room, locker rooms, uh, Facilities are designed to, for drop-in usage. Our examples are Beck, Central, Moorhead, um, ACAA, and soon the Southeast Recreation Center. Our community centers are facilities with limited amenities that do not include or have limited access to a major attraction, such as a gym or a pool, um, and they generally do not uh, allow itself to uh, have drop-in usage. And front desk staff is not generally required these examples are Village Green, Meadowood, and Expo. And then our last facility type is our natatorium or pool. And that's basically a dedicated aquatic facility like Utah Pool or Del Mar and all our rest of our outdoor pools. Currently, um, our youth programs is um, a list of our current programs here. Uh, we have a, a quite a variety of, of activities and uh, programs for youth. Uh, we have been experiencing kind of a COVID effect uh, from our programming, and that does um, impact our usage. Um, we have uh, staff shortages due to the job market, and uh, we basically estimate right now that our current offerings are about at 75% of what they were prior to COVID. But our list of programs do include uh, uh, activities that are available for youth in our community is dropping into a recreation center. Um, this is um, available for, for youth to come and work out, uh, uh, participate in open swim, uh, very popular is using our gyms, playing basketball and other activities. Um, this is recommended for ages 12 and up. Um, we also have our compass program, which is an after school program uh, for elementary and middle schools. We actually have uh, 10 locations. This is a collaborative program between us and Aurora Public Schools, and they are at uh, located at the school sites. This is something that happens from the time that school's out until about six o'clock at night. We also have a variety of sports uh, and athletic programs, uh, basically for um, youth from four to 14. This includes exploration, instructional and league play, um, for all the imaginable sports that you can imagine. And we just have added uh, skateboarding um, activity through uh, classes and some camps as well. Our preschool program is a very popular program. We have five locations. This is a state licensed program. Um, our preschool programs are focused on kindergarten readiness, uh, self-help, language skills, social, emotional, and motor development. Um, and we have, uh, five locations. Um, we also offer a wide variety of uh, classes and opportunities for youth, basically ages six months all the way to 17. Uh, these classes include aquatics, uh, um, 
learn to swim programs, uh, cooking classes, our fitness, we have martial arts, and we also have our youth enrichment programs, which includes the after school breaks and camps. We also, we also provide a wide variety of outdoor recreation programs. These are provided by our nature and open space division. And then we also have um, events year round for youth and families through our special events. And these are provided by our marketing and special events um, division. Our winter break program. Our winter break program was to address the immediate need for safe and positive spaces during winter break. The winter break program operated the last two weeks of December. They were for the ages of 12 to 17 and allowed free admission to Central and Moorhead Recreation Centers from noon to 8 p.m. A free snack and dinner was provided by the Aurora Public Schools. Youth who attended had an access to a variety of programs. Um, activities included uh, uh, activities in the gym, swimming, inner tube, water polo, improv, comedy classes, weightlifting, dances, uh, crafts, nature programs, um, the Aurora PD uh, 5 gaming trailer, and we even had um, a special event. Our HawkWest program came out and gave a uh, interactive program with some of their uh, birds. This was a very collaborative program, um, an event that was led by the Recreation Division of Pros, but our partners included the Youth Violence Prevention Program, Nature and Open Space, Libraries and Cultural Arts, Communication and Marketing, and the Aurora Police Department. Attendance, average daily attendance. We had 79 youth that attended daily at Central Recreation Center, and we averaged 28 that attended at Moorhead. We also um, had a survey, as you can see on the um, slide, that uh, the youth were able to access survey through a QR code. We had very good results. Um, basically, the summary was that we asked a lot of variety of questions about the events um, that were going on, as well as future events and things that we'd like to look at. Overall, the summary was that kids really enjoyed the program. They were glad that we had this for them. And um, they did note that the biggest barriers for youth to access activities like this is typically cost and transportation. The estimated cost for this activity did um, um, was estimated about $14,000. That was um, for um, additional supervision of areas and for the structured programs that were included. Some of the observations of this program were that um, the structured activities were not well attended. The majority of the youth wanted to play basketball and just be with friends. Um, in the future, what we would recommend that the uh, structured activities in the gym would be a, a great bonus. Uh, this would be focused on creating a more inclusive environment on the basketball court to let all players of all skill levels play. We look at a capacity of, of limiting kids that would be able to be on the gym because if you have too many, we can't allow, um, you wouldn't have basketball play. So we look at a capacity to restrict so that we could actually have games and activities going on. And this would reduce the hanging out mentality and the, minimize the risk of any incidences. Overall, the summary is, is that uh, more work needs to be done in this area to look at what programs will bring more youth into the recreation centers. We definitely need to gain more input from the youth. Next steps in evaluation is to finalize enhancing our program for spring break, which is March 14th through the 18th um, this spring. Uh, we were looking at, again, to provide free access for those uh, in that age group. Um, we'd like to continue to uh, uh, evaluate this program and then look at what we'll be able to do this summer. Uh, we would bring any recommendations to our policy committee going forward for what we'd recommend for the summer activities. And then um, ongoing, we definitely need to continue to expand uh, the citywide collaboration um, enhancing with more community partners and uh, nonprofits to make this a more sustainable program. Now on to our recreation facility update. 
So our recreation centers are open. We've been open for quite a while, but just to kind of go back into history, we wanted to look at uh, what has happened to us over the last uh, almost two years now. Um, as you know, um, we closed recreation facilities back on March 14th of 2020. Um, all facilities and programs closed at that time. Um, we did reopen um, after working along with our health department. Uh, we used guidance to help uh, develop informed decisions to open our centers and program safely. Um, our recreation centers reopened on July 6th. Uh, that was Moorhead Beck and Central Recreation Center. Um, again, we were continuing to fully open the rest of our facilities and by August 3rd of 2020, Meadowood Expo and Village Green reopened um, to full use. And then um, a little bit more of a delay, but going through that uh, the health process and, and verifying um, use and this would be after vaccinations were completed and high percentage of people that received vaccinations, but we were able to open up the Center for Active Adults on May 3rd of 2021. We are still affected, we're still, we're still impacted by COVID as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, not all of our guests returned. We don't have everyone back. We do feel that this is that uh, there's still people that feel that uh, they don't wanna gather in large groups. They don't wanna go out to a facility that has a large attendance of people. And so some people are restraining and, and staying away. We do think that they will eventually will come back when, when more things are, are more comfortable for them. Um, we've been greatly impacted by um, the labor market and hiring. Um, the part-time staff, um, which is a lot of our instructors, our fitness instructors, our lifeguards, they're just not returning back to the job market. And that has definitely impacted um, the amount of programs that we're able to offer. It has definitely limited us in our open swim hours, our lessons, and has reduced some offerings. But the bottom line is, we are open. All our facilities are being currently used um, as they were prior to COVID. Now drilling down a little bit more as requested by council that we take a look at Expo Community Center. Um, over the years, Expo has had many uses. Um, during the 1980s through the 90s, it was the headquarters to the Youth Ventures Before and After School program. When that program closed and following that program, the facility was remodeled with a teaching kitchen, a multi-purpose space and two classrooms. In 2016, one of the classrooms was converted to a small fitness area with a total of 14 pieces of equipment that included weights and cardio. Um, based upon the usage, and we'll drill down to that a little bit on the next slide, but based upon the usage and the efficiency, it was determined that Expo would return back to a scheduled facility as Meadowood and Village Green operate, meaning basically the programs and activities scheduled are scheduled. Um, staff then will unlock a building, and then when finished, then they will secure the building and leave. Um, this basically was a was a reason for us to take a look at uh, using Expo as the ideal centralized location for launching the um, eSports hub and uh, all the remaining equipment the 14 pieces of equipment was relocated to the Center for Active Adults and for into the Beck Recreation Center to make space. To take a closer look at our um, uh, usage at Expo as a, as a drop-in facility, as a trying to be a rec center, which it never quite was able to do that. And as I mentioned in the earlier slide, that was started in 2016 and through 2019. And I have the current 2019 data up as far as the usage. And as if you take a look at our pass sales, so these are anything from an annual pass to a six month to a punch card. Um, uh, we, we sold at Expo 161 passes during 2019. And if you compare it to our more traditional recreation centers, you can see a, a large difference there. As far as our annual visits, these are the pass holders visits. So as they come in and uh, they take a punch off their punch card or redeem their annual pass, these are their visits. And that was uh, 5,356. And then you have paid daily admissions. These are people that just came in and paid just for today's use. And that was 322 visits that just paid were paid by the day. So total in our usage at Expo for the year of 2019, which was a full year, 
we only had 5,678 visits to that facility. As you can compare to the other recreation centers, you can see the, the large volume difference. And that's what encouraged us to make a change in that facility by removing the fitness equipment and to um, establish our eSports hub. Um, do to note is that out of these uh, 5,600 visits, about 4,000 of those can be attributed to a program fitness class. And this would be still people coming in, they could either pay for it or they could use their, their pass and they could come in and just come in for that fitness class. Now, fitness classes haven't returned to Expo, but that goes back to the job market right now. We're just not able to hire the fitness instructors to come back to teach that class. Give a quick little tour here of um, the Expo Center that uh, um, we have the main entrance down at the bottom of the screen here. As you come in, there's the lobby area. We have a small classroom on the right. Um, we have a teaching kitchen um, that is still very popular, that's still heavily used. Um, and then if you actually go back to the front desk area and we go into the multi-purpose room, this is probably the most active space right now besides the kitchen. Um, which is um, used heavily by um, cultural arts uh, dance program, um, art classes that would return with when we can hire fitness instructors and uh, activities such as this. This main area was the area where we did have the fitness equipment located and um, is now slated to become our new um, eSports hub. As I mentioned, uh, the Expo Community Center is, is, is open and it is highly utilized. It's actually returned to its pre-COVID uh, usage. We average 46 hours a week. Um, peak usage time is Monday through Thursday, um, basically after school from three until nine. Um, and then we use it both days on Saturday and Sunday. Um, and this is the prime time when the youth are available and it's um, used extensively during that time frame. A little bit more about the eSports Hub. Um, as noted um, by uh, NRPA, our National Parks and Recreation Association, um, it's noted as the next big thing for parks and recreation, parks and recreation agencies. Um, also noting that the Colorado High School Activities Association, CHASA, has also officially made eSports a competitive sport uh, back in 2019. And in 2020, Gateway High School finished second place in the state championship. So it's definitely a growing trend. It's something that we would really want to be involved with. We're gonna attract um, a lot of youth to this program. Um, and it's another tool for us. Um, for many years, uh, we in recreations kind of stayed away from this because we're in the business of getting people active and move and you know, playing video games just has such a negative connotation. But we've come around full circle that you know, it is a great way for us to reach youth. We can. We can uh, contact with them. Um, they become uh, able to know us. Uh, they learn to trust us. Uh, we can expand their horizons and um, continue to grow with them. Um, and this is probably a population that we don't see in any of our other programs as well. So it's a great opportunity for us. Um, Expo does make it a, a great location because it's centralized within our community and it has available um, programming time um, to serve this group. Um, the hub has not uh, been mobilized yet, but could be mobilized as quickly as the second quarter. Um, and uh, we can start it on a temporary basis until the permanent hub can be constructed. Basically, we need to erect a wall in um, Expo so we have a little bit more security for all that computer equipment. Um, and this computer equipment will be great because we can utilize it not only with our e um, sports, but we can, uh, and e gaming, but we can also use it with our. Uh, STEM programs that we also have and have other classes um, that can utilize the computer equipment in many ways. And uh, lastly, what a great way for us to be able to collaborate with the uh, APD. Now that they have a new 5.0 gaming trailer, um, there could be a lot of partnerships that we could do, some tournaments, some different events, uh, uh, kids that will go to the locations where the gaming trailer is, we could be with them and then encourage them to come into our hub of a more permanent location. So a great opportunity for us to grow into the esports world.
And next, um, an update on our Meadowood Community Center, because this center has been asked to kind of explain the usage of that center. Um, a quick tour is that uh, the main entrance actually starts at the top of the page at this point, but you come in the facility, here's our front desk area, if you can see my cursor, um, and then you go into our preschool. Um, this location is home to one of our preschools, and uh, this space actually is shared by the dance program. So our preschool has to, every night has to fold up everything, put everything away, uh, store it all, um, all the materials, all the desks, all the chairs, and get it ready for dance. And in the morning, they have to move everything back out and get ready for the kids to come back into preschool. Um, so heavily utilized area. Um, but then if you do go down the hall, um, one of the main rooms in this facility is the gym. It's called a gym. It's a very small gym, and it's really not a gymnasium that is able to be used for gameplay. Half of the gymnasium has a dedicated gymnastics um, equipment. Uh, we have a spring floor that cannot be moved. It's something that is permanent, um, that you don't move that on a regular basis to, to make room for everything else. And the other side of the gym is uh, kind of what we call a multi-purpose space. But we can play a little bit of basketball because there's a little bit of there's some hoops up there. And so this space is used a lot by our preschool program uh, during the day. And it, it does house one of our summer camps um, during the summer. Um, Meadowood also has a second floor. Um, you come up the steps. Um, it's on the right side of the screen here. You come up the stairs here. There's a small office and then there's a small classroom here, which um, about five students um, uh, kind of specialty can uh, go into a dance class or another activity that we might program in that space. And Middlewood is uh, is 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 highly open. It's a it's a facility that's been opened as we open all the rest of our facilities in return. It is currently being you know you host one of the um, our Meadowood preschool. Um, it's our home to our gymnastics program. It hosts uh, youth and dance and our summer camp program. Uh, the facility uh, uh, is basically uh, programmed 83 hours a week, and that is back to its pre-COVID levels. Um, the reason why it's more than Expo is because it houses the preschool, which is a, a daytime operation. So it's open in the day. Um, basically from 7 until 9 um, is peak time Monday through Thursday. Fridays, it, uh, we have some dance programs that are in there that, that run a little bit later. And then we also have uh, the weekend activity that's highly used as well. Thank you for this uh, opportunity and happy to answer any questions. Mayor Jurinsky. Uh, Council Member Jurinsky. I just have one. It's more like a comment, I guess. I've, I've asked, I asked an orientation. So on the second slide of your very first presentation and you don't need to go back there, I just am trying to figure out how we still um, own and operate Aqua Vista swimming pool. Do we pay Centennial a lease for that? Do we, is, is it Aurora water that fills that pool? What, what, why do we, why do we still have uh, this pool? I mean, I went there as a little kid. I know it's one of the oldest pools, but when Centennial became a state, why didn't it, why didn't it go with it? I, and you don't need to answer that now. I, I just would like to find out this information and how it operates. And are we advertising in Centennial for it to come to an Aurora pool? Um, I, I just would like information about this pool and why aren't we selling it to Centennial? Well, staff, would you like to respond now or later? I can I can answer as far as operations since that is part of the recreation department. It is one of our pools. Um, we operate it as one of our pools. Um, we do not pay a lease on that pool. We own that pool um, and provide. Um, uh, that's one of our ten of our. It's a, one of the ten outdoor pools that we have. Um, it's a very popular pool um, in our in our system. So that is a a pool that we manage and operate um, annually. As far as the rest of your question of ownership and transfer and that sort of thing, I could look into that and uh, provide an update information to council. I'm sorry, is it outside the city of Aurora? Yes. Well, how did we have a pool, a facility that's outside of our city? How, how did that happen? 
it was in Aurora before Centennial became uh, a city. I had like my seventh birthday party there and it is a very popular pool, but I just want to know like logistically then. So if there's an emergency there, does is the Aurora police responsible mm. for showing up or does Arapahoe County? What, you know, whose water is filling this pool? Who's, it, it's absolutely not in Aurora. So, and if we're having staffing issues, you know, at our other locations, I just, I just don't, I don't understand how we have this pool and why we're not maybe looking at making a deal to have Centennial purchase that asset. Mm. Yeah, if you may, maybe your staff could prepare a memo uh, for council on that because I, I, if, I mean, it must have been an unincorporated Rapo County prior to the formation of Centennial. I mean, Centennial County yeah. annex part of Aurora. It, it could have had an Aurora address. And being and being in unincorporated Rapo County, it, it was in before Centennial became a city. Mm, I don't know how that would happen, but um, if staff could come, come up with a memo for uh, council, I'd appreciate that. Uh, seeing no further business uh, oh, before, you uh, questions, <laughs> uh, Councilmember McConnell. Thank you, sir. Um, so, and also, uh, thank you, Joe, for the presentation. Um, so I want to hit on the staffing shortages a little bit here. Um, do you, we have an idea of what the issue is? Is it pay? Is it hours? Is it COVID risks? Some combination of that? Something else? Um, you know, I we it everyone's a little bit different depending upon the area that you're looking at. Fitness instructors are different than lifeguards, um, other instructors, and so forth. So it's it's all a little bit different. And I actually say it's a it's a blending of all those issues. It is. Um, you know, we've heard from our, our lifeguards is that uh, a lot of them were burnt out during the last two years and just have felt um, kind of that, that feeling that I just don't want to come back. I just want to do something different and I don't want to do that anymore. Um, probably they felt that impact because we were um, using them quite readily because we were short staffed. And so they were um, asked to do a lot. Um, so that's one area. Um, our fitness instructors, we, we have found that a lot of um, fitness instructors have left the industry and have been found other work or, or just not decided to return. Um, we also had some um, general instructors that also have made comments to us that, you know, um, they're just not so comfortable coming back in an environment um, about the time where people start feeling a little bit better. Um, then Omicron, you know, takes off and something else happens. So it just keeps delaying. Um, and it's a very individual um, decision. It's not generally, you know, like a, a whole group is making a collective decision. Um, everybody's kind of individual um, making choices. Okay, thank you. And what have we done to kind of try to combat that? Well, we're constantly um, looking for new ways to recruit and advertise. Um, we have worked with our... Um, Human Resources Department on competitive salaries. We're actually taking a look right now for our seasonal um, salary rates coming up for this summer um, to take an aggressive look at, at making sure that we can remain competitive uh, within the job marketplace and that sort of thing. So again, staff has um, always come up with new creative ideas to try to recruit new staff. Okay, great. Um, for other questions? Mayor, I have a few more, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I have I'll let Councilman oh. Gardner go and then I'll come back. I have a Councilman Gardner, Gardner, then Councilman McConnell. Oh, okay. Um, so I have a question about, um, I guess, the programming. And, I, and I'm curious, kind of in the context of the youth violence conversation um, that we've been having, you had said earlier in the presentation that a lot of the more programmed activities were less popular and um, a lot of the, the kids played basketball or hung out or whatever. And there was a line in there that said additional outreach to youth or, or something like that. And so I'm just curious what that's gonna look like because of course, you know, we can come up with all these great ideas, but if it's not what kids want to do, then it doesn't really serve a purpose and we're just spinning our wheels. So I'm curious what our process is gonna be to find out what programming, if any, kids will be interested in um, and, and kind of, how that's going to look. You know, it's a very great comment um, and a very good question. Um, we, that's what we need to do. Um, some of this is going to be an experimental process. We're going to need to, one, we need to develop a trust with the, with the youth, with the teenagers. Um, they have to feel comfortable coming into the recreation center and then, and then telling us what they would like. And uh, that's going to take some time for them to be able to do this. 
our first and and you know it's not we're not foreign to to the youth they do like to come into the rec centers we've had kids in the rec centers for for years decades i mean that's what we do but um it's not been so structured and that's where we need to have that a little bit more of a controlled environment so that it's safe for everyone everybody's it's inclusive we can get participation um the, in the past, the recreation centers have been kind of considered that hangout place, and that's not a, a, a healthy um, environment for the kids or for the staff or the rest of the patrons that are coming into the recreation centers. So I think for us going forward, I think what it's gonna take is it's gonna take that collaborative group um, working towards some solutions that um, use the recreation centers as a host site and um, really take a look at what programs um, the youth really want. It's gonna take a lot of discussion with the, with the kids to, to find out the, uh, those activities. My experience has been that uh, as soon as we hit on something and it becomes really, really popular and the kids all think it's really cool, well then it starts to decline because it's too cool and they have to find another activity. So that's just kind of some of the frustrations that we've had with, with working with, with the teenagers. But, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be very successful going forward. Um, I think us doing this again on spring break, it's gonna start developing a track record. Um, through that process, we hope to be able to develop something we can bring forward to the policy committee on um, what we could do this summer. And then um, we'll see kind of where this goes from here. Yeah, I appreciate that. I I, I think that's kind of my, my point is, you know, we can come up with all these programs but if again if kids aren't interested in that then um it, it doesn't serve a purpose and you know i'm i'm apparently a millennial but i feel like i'm in a different world than um, other people that are labeled as millennials and so um, i just hope that we kind of take that process seriously of of figuring out what they're interested in and not just saying here's the programming we have enjoy it or don't it's it's up to you thank you councilman mcconnell <laughs> thank you mayor and uh, I think Councilmember Gardner, uh, I've heard someone say that we're considered geriatric millennials. So, <laughs> but I'm with you there. For me. <laughs> um, so I wanted to uh, ask, um, so kind of actually on the same vein as what Councilmember Gardner was talking about here on that slide. Um, one of the concerns I've heard from, you know, from our community members here in Ward 4, um, both folks who work in youth violence prevention and just folks who enjoyed, like some of our more senior residents who just enjoyed having open access to Expo um, is, you know, they're just really, really irritated that it was kind of closed and repurposed without community feedback. Um, and I understand that they had a lower, you know, volume of use than uh, Moorhead, I'm sorry, not Moorhead, um, Meadowood. Um, but I, one of the big concerns I have is that apparently a lot of youth uh, did go there to kind of hang out. And I think I heard you, and please correct me if I misheard you, say that that's not something you want folks doing? Um, well, let me let me answer a few things that you made, a, that you asked in there is, is one that we never had a high volume of kids that came to Expo because there really was, there's nothing for them really to do there. There was not a gym to play basketball. Um, there really wasn't any that, you know, there, if you're not in a scheduled program, there really wasn't anything to do. You know, we did have, um, some tables in the lobby where kids can play some games. Uh, the library used to have some computers that were able to have free access that the kids did. That program has been taken out. Um, so we we really just didn't have, we weren't an attraction. There was no reason for some kids to, you know, to come in. Um, and and no, we really don't. Our, our recreation centers are, are active places. So kids to come in just to gather, to sit around, is we're not designed for that. That's not really what a recreation center um, right now, the, our current recreation centers, we don't really have those spaces to be able to do that. And um, that group, you know, hanging out mentality really doesn't work well with the, the customers, the families that want to, you know, play basketball with their kids or to work out on the weight, weight machines. If there's just a lot of teenagers hanging out, there's, you know, we had at Central after our first, um, partial year of operation, we have had, um, you know, there was people that canceled their annual passes because um, the center was was dominated by, by teenagers and we were actually having quite a lot of uh, problems. So we've gone to more of a scheduled usage of the center, kind of controlling capacities and um, everybody's really complimented on us. We actually, um, the police chief has has complimented us on the, on the use of the facility. Um, before we closed in COVID, 
we were actually starting to look at hiring a off-duty policeman as security. And since then, we um, reopening back in July that we, we haven't had to do that uh, because of the way that we're managing the facility right now. So we've been really successful. Um, so no, we really don't want kids to come to the recreation center to, to hang out, but we do want them to come in and participate in the programs and the activities. And we want them to go to the pool. We want them to get on the court. We want them to take a class in, in weightlifting and that sort of thing. I think one of the biggest barriers that we have is, is access. Is that, is it free? Do we, do we start looking at that to give them access? Is it free? Is it, is it, um, a reduced cost? Um, those are kind of the conversations that we're going to need to have going forward. Yeah. So, um, Joe, I, I got a, like what you're, what I'm hearing from you is that the kids were gathering. We don't want them to gather <coughs> and we need to figure out what the kids want to do. It sounds to me like they want to gather <laughs> and hang out with their friends and, you know, how, because one of the things is like, you know, that I, what I've learned just, you know, work talking to the folks who are working in youth violence prevention, both, you know, on staff, uh, it can some of the community groups that we're partnering with and also just like youth at events that, you know, I think several of myself and several of my colleagues have been at. It's like, this might be what you're talking, what you're describing as like undesirable behavior at our rec centers might be like the one safe place these kids have to go in a day. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it sounds to me like we're, kind of undermining our own best efforts to try to get youth violence under control by potentially foisting these kids back out somewhere else where they're gonna get in trouble, get into a fight, you know, or just go back into an unsafe environment. So, you know, combine that with a little bit about what you were talking about with the esports thing, I think that that is something that's still hip and cool. Like I'm, I'm old, but I'm not that old, right? <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, the success of, you know, a bunch of like alternative platforms now and the growth of esports, I think speaks to that, but, I really think we need to reevaluate that policy of we don't want kids just kind of idling around. You know, like if that's where they're safe, if they're not getting into trouble there, I understand some people might find that as like a, I don't know, just annoying or off-putting for some reason, but gosh, we gotta look at the, you know, what's it doing for our youth, you know? Um, and uh, you, you actually kind of alluded to something, that one of my other questions is what does it cost to do what Denver does and actually get, provide basically free services to our youth? Because I think that's a huge barrier to access like you, like you said. Definitely, and I think we're, we're starting to look into more programs like that, and I think that's something we can definitely bring forward to council in the future, and uh, maybe some proposals of what that would look like. Yeah, I would love to see that. I mean, I think that's, you know, just a no-brainer, honestly, especially given what, you know, some of the activity that you just described here, so. Um, you know, to answer your kind of your point about the, you know, hanging out and that sort of thing, I think that if that's what we want to do, we need to create an event or a program that allows them to do that. You know, that 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 doesn't really work well when you have a, a facility that's scheduled and people are paying to get access to use the amenities in that area. And then you have another group that had maybe potentially free access and they don't have to really participate or not, they're not doing anything. Our suggestion probably would be is that we would create some events around um, kind of a kind of a special event, um, kind of a, a carnival, a festival where we could bring a lot of nonprofits and community partners in. And we would do these like um, on, on a Friday or a Saturday night where they could be these, you know, large events where it would be a draw for kids to come into the rec centers and to, uh, there'd be a lot of activities that they would be wanting to participate in, games and activities and carnivals and inflatables and different things like that, that that um, the youth would be attracted to come to. And that would be probably something that we would look forward um, more towards the summer to be able to, to offer that. Sure, um, just Mayor, if we can turn some other I have a so. question. May, uh, may I make a comment? This is Brooke. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, uh, Director uh, Brooke, please proceed. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Marcano, we have been in conversations with Denver um, and talking to them about their programming, how it's funded, how it's subsidized, and some of the things that are working really well for them and other things that have been less successful. And as Joe said, we'd be happy to bring you more information about that. And, and further ideas. Um, we just started those conversations last week. Um, they do have some really creative, unique ideas that Joe alluded to. Some one-time events are Friday night, every other Friday night, basketball, 
uh, tournaments and shootouts. So they've got some fun things going on, but they are highly subsidized. Denver's recreation program is subsidized 95% by the general fund. Okay. And we're typically about 50%. Uh, All right. Well, so. I, I would love to see that information. Um, hopefully the sooner the better. And I just want to, again, say that, you know, uh, Joe, I'm, I'm not saying no to events. I think that's great. I want to actually, you know, increase uh, engagement with city services, especially for our youth. But again, like, let's look at what we're effectively being told by our youth with the way that they behave, right? It sounds like we also need some just community spaces where folks can have unstructured time, again, and like what may be like one of the few safe environments that they actually have in a given day. So I, I really don't think we can overlook that. Uh, but thank uh, you so much I, for the presentation. It's been very illuminating. Mayor, Brooke again. Oh, uh, yes, please proceed. Yeah, I'd also like to say that we are embarking on a system-wide master plan. I know that council knows we've had that budgeted. Um, we have um, hired the contractor. We're just waiting on the final um, contract details. But my vision, our vision for that master plan is that we will have robust community engagement and it will address not only um, recreation, parks, open space, but also the needs of different um, groups, age groups. So the needs of the youth, um, the needs of our aging community in Aurora. Uh, we have heard very clearly over the last few weeks that we have missed the mark on, on engagement and we are going to improve. We need to improve, we'll go, we will improve. With regard to youth engagement, we can look to the Youth Commission um, and also use this uh, pros master planning effort. Um, and uh, yeah, so I hope that helps out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, further discussion? Questions? Just have a question and it's kind of- Oh, Mayor Martini? Yeah, it's kind of for all recreation centers. Do we charge uh, those who live outside of Aurora a different rate than than Aurora residents for our recreation centers? Yes, we have a resident and non-resident rate. Okay, because I thought there was, I, I thought that I was told that they, we don't have a non-resident rate. No, we do, we do. We do, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Further questions, comments? Seeing none, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, with no further business before the council, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Good night, y'all.